for today's agenda, we will keep kick off with uh, some great speakers, some great presentations that will help help us uh, situate some of the conversations that we've been having um, previously, as well as some of the conversations that we'll co continue to have for the rest of the day. Um, so we're going to be hearing from speak speakers who will share their contexts um, within which they're operating, their experience in advancing uh, beneficial ownership transparency, um, and then that will lead us into the breakout session. So there are two breakout sessions coming up. The first one on legal approaches to take in the advancement of beneficial ownership. And the second, uh, exploring how best to collect uh, quality beneficial ownership data. Finally, we have a session with speakers from government, from civil society, and from business uh, that we'll, we hope will help inform your own strategies, uh, collective strategies back home. Uh, in advancing beneficial ownership transparency. Then we have a few short breaks in the agenda uh, throughout the day so that everybody can get a coffee, everybody can get their stretches in, and we can, we can keep moving. So before we introduce, um, I think, our first session, I wanted to give a very brief um, state, state of play for Africa um, and just highlight a couple of things uh, regarding especially legal provisions uh, and frameworks um, requiring the disclosure of collection of beneficial ownership, transparency uh, and information, as well as establishing beneficial ownership registers. Now with the legal scope in particular, the main focus broadly speaking, um, broadly speaking is on the importance of the definition of who a beneficial owner is, as well as the importance of requiring this information from all legal vehicles, so not just companies. Um, and I think we had started to hear, especially on who our beneficial owner, beneficial owner is uh, yesterday, um, with Botswana doing particularly well because it does not specify uh, a control threshold for someone to qualify as a beneficial owner. In Ghana and in Seychelles, the definition stipulates control thresholds similar to the Financial Action Task Force, uh, which is 25% ownership. Um, the challenge, of course, with that means that uh, that means that uh, some people can basically register a company and ensure that uh, they don't um, they don't uh, meet the twenty five percent mark. That way, they're not a beneficial owner. On the importance of requiring beneficial ownership information from all legal vehicles and not just companies, I think most African countries have provisions on beneficial ownership uh, disclosure. And the focus has been mainly uh, on companies, but then again, leaving out entities such as trusts, foundations, partnerships limited by liability and so on. Seychelles and Tunisia, I think are two examples that have broadened the requirements to include partnerships limited by liability, which is a good start, uh, but more really needs to be done. Uh, overall, uh, overall, I think it's fair to say basically that no country um, in the world has yet achieved that ideal of beneficial ownership uh, registration. Uh, so it's a shared challenge, but I think one that uh, as we institute our regimes, uh, we should be at the forefront with. So um, I think we now introduce um, our first sessions. Uh, we have presentations from OGP, Open Ownership and EITI, uh, which are aimed to aimed at bringing home the high level conversations that we've been having um, and make them more technical. Uh, the focus on this session will be on how countries transition from commitment to actual reforms and what tools, frameworks, approaches um, exist within OGP, EITI and open ownership spaces uh, for us to, 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 to advance beneficial ownership. So um, Tonu will kick us off. Tonu, you can kick us off with a global perspective from OGP. Thank you so much uh, to our co-hosts, EITI and Open Ownership and, and other fantastic partners who are on the call today. It is always lovely to see so many familiar faces and, and, and several new colleagues to discuss this important discussion, uh, have this important conversation following from yesterday's meeting. Now, um, I'll talk a little bit about the state of play, but then really focus on the kind of global frameworks we have and how they can be leveraged 
uh, for the region and in country action and what we're seeing in OGP. Um, so in recent years, you know, we've, we've seen various data leaks, including the Panama and Paradise Papers, the FinCEN files more recently, and critical investigative reporting, including from the region, has unveiled the scale of illicit financial flows um, on the continent. Now to sort of go back to some numbers that we heard yesterday, so Helen Clark, the chair of EITI, quoted figures from the UNCTAD report that cited that Africa loses about $88 billion US dollars in illicit capital flight every year. And that's equivalent to about 3.7% of the continent's GDP. According to the same report, digging in a little bit, uh, we also saw that in 2015, extractive industries accounted for an estimated 40 billion uh, illegal outflows, according to the same report. Now, the cost of these losses, I don't need to sort of explain to all of us. Um, it's a heavy one on the continent. It's the sort of public services in light of the current public health crisis on vaccines and on job creation. Uh, now, actually, according to this, the same UN report, again, if illicit financial flows out of Africa were curbed altogether, so the heart of the issue that we're discussing today, it would reduce by almost half a uh, 200 billion annual funding gap that is required for African countries to meet, meet the SDG goals. So I think that that kind of what happens, it, that costs are very, very live in our discussion today. Now, what are some of the global standards and principles that exist? For those of the, you who were there yesterday, Tom Townsend from Open Ownership mentioned some of them, but just to go into detail on some of them and how they can be leveraged as you think about national uh, or domestic reform. Now, countries should implement reforms as um, such as establishing a public and open beneficial ownership register to end anonymous companies. There is increasing recognition across some of these global forums on the importance of doing that. Now, to name a few, first, the UN High Level Panel on International Financial Accountability, Transparency and Integrity, which is the FACTI panel some of you may have heard of, they launched their report um, in February earlier this year, and they recommended an international anti-money laundering standard, including requiring all countries to create a central beneficial ownership register and in encouraging them to make this information public. Second, the Financial Action Task Force, again, several governments very, very familiar with it, is currently, uh, currently considering a re revision to the Recommendation 24, which deals with beneficial ownership. The G20 high-level principles and the G20 anti-corruption working group met um, just a, a few weeks ago, including with a joint meeting in FATF, they recognize the importance of beneficial ownership and see this as a priority, and hopefully we will see that in their new action plan. Now, for those of you familiar with uh, the COVID response and recovery, the IMF, um, in a significant move to promote transparency and, and accountability in its emergency lending, asked member countries requesting emergency assistance to commit to preventing conflicts of interest and corruption by publishing the beneficial ownership information of firms awarded procurement contracts. Finally, the first ever UN General Assembly special session on anti-corruption, some of you may know, will be taking place in a few days um, in, in early June. And its draft political declaration, we hope to see sort of more ambition, but has acknowledged the need for signatories to develop and implement measures uh, necessary to collect and share information on beneficial ownership of companies. Again, we hope to see more, but there is an acknowledgement um, of this. And finally, there is EITI standard, there are the open ownership principles will really show the importance of the countries here, EITI and OGP members, to, to implement those. Now, practically speaking, what does this mean, right? All of these different standards and, and, and frameworks that exist. Now, practically speaking, for countries in the region that are yet to see the necessary legal and policy progress on the issue as much as we hope, these global standards and principles provide valuable, but also practical entry points. For civil society partners, several of you on this call, they have provided a strong advocacy hook. And for officials, several of you again, they have provided frameworks that have been adapted to domestic policy. A quick word on the issue of central public register and, and some of the questions you will hear across later today and some of the questions that have been surfaced. So the needs and challenges around necessary legislative frameworks, um, the, the assessment of current systems for collecting, storing and publishing data and alignment to public and uh, privacy um, and data disclosure frameworks, assessment on the quality of data, um, along with recognized data standards such as of open ownership, as well as on data use. 
we can't assume that just public publishing a beneficial ownership register will curb corruption. But we really need to work with business, with journalists, data scientists, and others to ensure that this is interoperable with other systems, whether of licensing or of procurement, to really make sure that this does the job. And there is growing value, uh, body of evidence on the value of public registers, and we'll hear more later today. Now on uh, focusing on OGP and, and how we're seeing some of the, these, these sort of conversations around public registers and how we've seen some of this in OGP. We have seen several countries using their OGP action plans to advance on these standards and principles. So starting the UK was the first country that used OGP as a forum in 2013, back in 2013, to make the first ever global commitment for a public and open beneficial ownership register when they were chair of OGP and hosted the global summit. This followed on a strong advocacy, advocacy campaign by Transparency International UK, the One Campaign, Global Witness and others, and which finally um, uh, resulted in the Prime Minister announcing this commitment. Fast forward today, we have 32 OGP countries, several EITI members within that, including Armenia, Slovakia, United Kingdom, Chile, um, who have been making commitments on these. But importantly, no fewer than 40% of OGP members are currently implementing a beneficial ownership commitment. In Africa, what does this look like? Seven out of 15 OGP members have made commitments on beneficial ownership, several of you in the room, Ghana, Kenya, Liberia, Nigeria. Now, what does this data really mean? What, what does that look like? So um, several OGP members have uh, leveraged their action plans to um, advance commitments on the EITI standards. On the continent, we've seen that notably in Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Liberia. For instance, Sierra Leone committed to strengthen beneficial ownership register and expose conflict of interest among politically exposed persons. We've seen this in other countries um, across other continents, whether Mongolia or the Philippines, as they've advanced on the EITI standard. What several of you have done is used the OGP as a complement to EITI MSGs and extended from a single sector register to a cross sector central public register. And a lot of the progress on these commitments has been tackled and, and, and tracked through the OGP's independent reporting mechanism or the IRM. Now we're seeing um, nearly half of OGP beneficial ownership commitments are explicitly linked to either contracting or extractive licensing and something for partners and colleagues here to consider for your future OGP commitments. However, why we're here today, while several of these countries were seeing these commitments being made, we're seeing a significant implementation gap. And this is not just due to technical and financial resource crunch, it is also due to sustained political commitment that is needed to advance this reform. Here, you know, very quickly wrapping up, um, Nigeria is a good example from making a a commitment in 2016 at the Anti-Corruption Summit, civil society partners worked with the government to embed this in their first ever OGP action plan. Uh, as Nigeria developed its beneficial ownership register in the extractive sector under the auspices of uh, NATI, of course, civil society, private sector, as well as officials such as you know um, the, those from the companies, um, sort of the CAC here, um, have now worked to extend this to a several uh, a central and public register. Nigeria also shared its progress on the beneficial ownership through this process as part of its discussions with the IMF and have been working with several partners here today, whether it's the EITI, the World Bank, Open Ownership, or the um, UKFCDO, to move forward on implementation. We're seeing a lot of appetite ads today for open dialogue and peer learning for implementers, including through what we've started as the Beneficial Ownership Leadership Group, a group that we convene, co-convene with open ownership, uh, where we're looking to bridge the gap between implementation and emerging international standards for a group of countries leading on advancing relation, uh, with relation to public and open beneficial ownership registers. Finally, as I close, a reminder that we really want to see beneficial ownership not as a standalone reform, but really as linked to procurement, licensing, and others as you look at anti-corruption, but also working in coordination with private sector and legislators, as we've seen done in Nigeria, Kenya, and other places. Um, so we really hope that the discussions today build on the external panel, excellent panel presentations yesterday, and we'll focus on the how. 
Uh, and we hope to see the growing coalition of countries in Africa really tackle this through OGP action plans that are developed in, um, over the course of this year. Thanks so much. Over back to you, Maureen. Thanks so much, Tonu, uh, for really an excellent uh, overview. Uh, please, if you have any reactions, any thoughts to some of these uh, presentations that are coming up, please uh, share those in the chat and our speakers can respond either on chat or if we have time, uh, we can come back for them to take them directly. Um, so now I'm going to go to uh, Louise uh, of Open Ownership. Uh, it's her birthday as well today, so please feel free to, to send a happy birthday message. Uh, who will be giving us uh, some best practice um, advice when it comes to, to beneficial ownership, uh, data collection, uh, legal provisions, ETC. So uh, Louise, I think you had uh, some slides. Yes. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Maureen. Pleasure to be here. I couldn't think of a better way to spend my birthday than to um, be on this group, actually, with so many experts. It's, it's genuinely exciting to see so many people come together to talk, um, as Tonu and Maureen were saying, about the how of doing this. Can I just check that people can see my slides? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so yeah, as Tony highlighted, um, there's really tremendous momentum on beneficial ownership transparency across the world. And I wanted to talk briefly about how countries are operationalizing their commitments to beneficial ownership transparency and some of the good practices that we're seeing emerge from this. Um, but first I thought to highlight the commitments um, to BOT that have been made particularly across Africa that Tony was just referring to. So this map shows countries that have committed to BOT in either some or all sectors of the economy. And from uh, our vantage point at open ownership, we're seeing both Africa along with Europe that are really leading the way globally on this issue. But as we heard uh, yesterday, and as it's already been mentioned today as well, um, commitments, of course, are only impactful if they lead to effective implementation. And that's really where open ownership's work is um, focused. So for those who aren't familiar with open ownership, um, we work globally on beneficial ownership transparency. Um, so we do three things. We provide technical assistance to governments that are implementing BOT, and we've worked with almost 40 jurisdictions to do so. And from this work supporting implementation, we develop policy guidance and research to identify and share good practices. And then we develop tools that support the use of data. And we also analyze the beneficial ownership data that's currently available ourselves to learn more about good practice. And in terms of sharing good practice with you, um, we, we do see the same challenges occurring across many of the countries that we're engaged with, um, some of which have already been mentioned, um, how to verify data, how to determine effective thresholds when defining beneficial ownership. And the precise solutions to these, of course, do vary according to the specific national context. However, we've identified, along with others, many of you um, who are on this call, we've identified nine overarching principles that underpin effective beneficial ownership disclosure. And these really offer us a framework um, for understanding what good practice means, and it's supported by detailed guidance that we've produced for implementers. So I'll introduce these principles now and highlight where we open ownership are seeing them being operationalized across Africa. And I'm sure, of course, there are many more examples um, than the ones I'm about to mention. And I really look forward to hearing from um, all of you as experts um, throughout today's meeting. So here are the nine open ownership principles as we're referring to them. Um, and I'll talk briefly through um, each and I'll post a link to uh, the documentation um, and supporting research in chat afterwards. So the first principle is that beneficial ownership should be robustly defined in law with low thresholds used. And Maureen um, highlighted the example of Botswana and some other practices in place across the region. And um, it was picked up in chat, I believe Seychelles has actually now recently changed its threshold from 25% to 10%. And I believe actually Senegal has opted for a 2% threshold. Um, and this is really emblematic of a trend that we see um, globally towards uh, lower thresholds 
for defining beneficial ownership. The principle, the second principle on comprehensive coverage is really about ensuring that all types of companies and all sectors of the economy are covered by BO disclosure requirements. And again, Maureen mentioned some of the issues with um, making sure that all types of uh, legal entity are covered. And this is also about the sectors of the economy that are covered. And several countries across Africa we've seen make commitments and started to implement beneficial ownership registers that cover um, companies in all sectors of the economy. Uh, for example, Ghana, it was mentioned, was starting with the extractive sector and then building out from this. The third principle on sufficient detail being disclosed simply means that the information that is disclosed should be sufficient for people to understand and use the data. And I'm sure that the intricacies of this will come up at quite some length in both of the breakout sessions that we have later. So these first three principles relate to what's actually disclosed and for which companies. And the next three principles relate to who can access that data. Data being held in a central register is really a foundational principle for beneficial ownership transparency. And it recognizes the progress that countries across Africa and beyond have um, made to meet the FATF BO requirements through having a central register, rather than just requiring the companies or regulated entities to hold beneficial ownership data. Now, data being accessible to the public, of course, is one of the most discussed aspects of BOT reforms. And here, of course, several um, countries in Africa have committed to making beneficial ownership data public for some or all sectors of the economy. And we heard yesterday about the importance of political will, of course, to be sustained and to do this. Um, and also, uh, we touched on yesterday, and I'm sure we'll touch on later today, how governments um, can mitigate some of the privacy concerns that can be raised throughout that process. So the principle that data should be structured means that it exists in a standardized format and can be read by computers. And this, of course, makes it much easier to analyze and link with other data sets and is something um, that we'll discuss uh, much more, I'm sure, in the data quality breakout group. And I'll mention that open ownership, we're working with um, Nigeria at the moment to implement the beneficial ownership data standard in order to achieve this. And we've worked with other implementers in the region, uh, including South Africa and Liberia to support thinking around um, developing software for beneficial ownership registers and looking at how data is collected. So the last three principles really relate to the reliability of the data and taking measures to verify the data is a critical issue everywhere. And good practice, to be honest, is, is really only just starting to emerge. And I know um, perhaps you're on this call that implementers in Kenya and Zambia are really considering it deeply how best they can achieve this, as I'm sure many others here are. Um, and we can talk more about that, I'm sure, as a group and um, share some resources with one another to share thinking on that. And just to briefly touch on the last two principles, um, keeping data up to date and maintaining historical records is viewed as really important for, for example, aiding investigations into corruption or money laundering that may relate to um, practice and use of legal entities some years past. And then finally, having adequate sanctions in place and of course enforcing these is a key mechanism that we see implementers um, can use to improve compliance and accuracy of the data. So I've given a very brief overview of the open ownership principles um, and there's further information and a lot of detailed guidance and research that sits under these, which I'll share some links um, with you in the chat. But I hope that this helps frame the conversations that we'll have today, um, really about the practicalities of implementing BO reforms um, effectively. So I look forward to hearing more from you throughout the sessions. Thanks so much, Louise. Uh, that was really, really comprehensive. Um, we are slightly behind time, but I'll pass very quickly to, to Ines uh, to give us uh, a specific um, angle from the extractive sector, Ines. Thank you. I will do my best to uh, try to catch up. Can you just confirm if you can see my screen? Yes, we see your screen. And uh, can you see the can you see the slide if I flick now?
Yes, we do. Apologies. Um, okay, sorry. I, I understand someone else is, is sharing my slide. Is that correct? Okay, um, while, while we set that up, um, thank you, Maureen, and thank you everyone for joining this uh, technical session. I really look forward to learning from all of you um, and obviously wish we could have been together in person, but we hope that by the next time we meet, we'll be sharing experiences face to face. I will be touching on the progress made towards beneficial ownership transparency in the extractive industry and how countries in the African region have used the EITI to um, progress on their beneficial ownership um, transparency reforms. I also will be highlighting how beneficial ownership data can be used to improve natural resource governance. Um, next slide, please. As uh, Tonus already highlighted, we all know why beneficial ownership transparency is important to address uh, risks of illicit financial flows. When it comes to the extractive industry in particular, having access to beneficial ownership data is important in every step of the value chain, from the very point of the award of contracts, to monitoring of production, to tax collection and the management of revenues. Knowing who the government is doing business with and sells its valu valuable extractive assets to is, is essential. I will not be able to go into all the examples here as you see along the value chain uh, on uh, use uh, of the information, uh, but I wanted to highlight a few, um, notably around licensing, how beneficial ownership um, data can ensure that reputable com companies are awarded uh, contracts um, and also prevent conflict of interest in, in the award of, of licenses. Uh, in, tax collection, in tax collection phase, beneficial ownership data can help expose shell companies and schemes that are used for tax evasion. Uh, we know in, in, uh, on the African continent, local content is, is really important in the extractive industry and having uh, information on beneficial owners of companies uh, help avoid circumvention of national ownership uh, requirements because you can know who are the ultimate owners and what their nationalities and countries of residence are. Finally, um, one point that I find always very interesting is that um, beneficial ownership data is such uh, uh, important information for companies in their due diligence when they decide who they uh, want to enter into business with um, in a country, on a project, in a joint venture, who they want to uh, contract uh, as suppliers, um, and we know that they are uh, really a key user of, of BO data. Um, uh, and that is, is also uh, really important in the extractive um, sector. So all of this uh, to say that this is uh, why we do have uh, the requirement adopted in 2016 that uh, will be shown on the next slide, um, which is a requirement uh, for all EITI member countries to ensure that companies that apply for or hold a participating interest in an oil, gas, or mining license or contract disclose their beneficial owners. Um, so if the next slide could be shared, um, you will see the requirement um, shown here. Um, I'm sure my colleagues will probably pull it up in a bit. Um, and on the next slide again, uh, you will see a bit more detail on what it is that, uh, that we require. Um, so this does include uh, information on uh, uh, the identity of the beneficial owner, <clears throat> including the name, nationality, on, and country of residence, clear indication of whether the owner is uh, politically exposed, um, and this information could include other details of date of birth, um, residential address, etc. And this information should ideally uh, be maintained in the public register of beneficial owners. Um, perhaps if someone could please move to the next slide, you'll see the a bit more detail on what's disclosed, what's, re what's required by the EITI standard. Um, next uh, slide again, please. So what has been the progress in EITI countries? Um, so we have seen, and I will share some, some concrete examples, uh, some countries that have uh, made established public uh, ownership registers. Uh, obviously, UK is a, is, is a clear uh, example, but we know in the region, Nigeria, Ghana, others are making uh, progress uh, on the establishment of, of central public registers. Um, there's also a 
huge effort on the continent uh, to undertake legal reforms that help facilitate beneficial ownership transparency, and we look forward to hearing more about this a bit later. We also know that um, several countries have been reviewing data collection forms. That really is a key uh, step to improve the quality of information disclosed. Um, we are also excited that uh, more than half of EITI countries have publicly disclosed some beneficial ownership information through EITI reporting. Uh, and many of those countries are uh, African countries. So what's really critical here is to make sure that um, data collection uh, is as much as possible integrated with the existing systems uh, for data collection on the government and company side and to make sure that the data is comprehensive and disclosed in a way that can really help um, uh, stakeholders in using that information. Finally, uh, and, and very importantly, we have seen uh, some countries disclose information on uh, politically exposed persons who um, hold uh, interest in oil, gas and mining licenses. And this is really key to be able to identify um, risks of conflict of interest, for example. So uh, there are several different approaches being taken by EITI countries. And on the next slide, please, um, you'll see uh, just examples from <clears throat> The UK uh, register uh, where you can find information on the beneficial owners of, of a company, uh, including uh, address, um, uh, date of birth, nationality, country of residence, and detail on the nature of the control. And, uh, and we will be hearing later about Nigeria as well, who's been making efforts to establish a, a public register. And you can go uh, online to find information on uh, legal owners um, through the, the Nigerian Corporate Affairs Commission uh, website. Um, we also have uh, other approaches. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, you see an example from Myanmar, where the company register has established um, a portal on their website with beneficial ownership data specifically for extracted companies. And this required very close coordination with uh, the EITI in, in Myanmar and the company register to update the forms to make sure that the extracted companies were aware they had to publish this information and for this de uh, quite detailed information uh, on, on the website to be disclosed, including indication of whether um, they are politically exposed persons. Um, finally, um, I, I'm, I'm mindful of time, uh, but so I'm, I'm nearly there. But finally, we have also seen examples of countries publishing beneficial ownership data using their extracted license register where you already have quite a lot of information on active licenses and license holders and, and here you see an example from Afghanistan. Um, on the next slide you also see efforts by Nigeria, Trinidad, EITI, others to help um, pilot some of these disclosures um, which also helps uh, test out um, what, what works. So um, I will just finish on this final slide on why the focus on the extractive industries uh, is important. Of course, significant amounts of investments and, and revenues. We know there's a strong interest case because natural resources belong to citizens and therefore you want to know who owns the companies that, um, that are developing those, those resources. Uh, but uh, I think ultimately uh, we have seen that the work in the extractive sector can serve as a springboard for broader reforms. We know in Ghana that the, the piloting of these disclosures in the extractive sector have helped inform broader reforms. In Nigeria as well, NATI and the Corporate Affairs Commissions um, have just teamed up to establish an interagency uh, committee to help drive uh, beneficial ownership transparency reforms. So this is a really good opportunity to use the EITI to drive uh, broader reforms um, when it comes to beneficial ownership transparency. Um, Ines, I'll, I'll stop you there. Uh, thank you so much for uh, a very excellent overview. Uh, thanks to all three speakers. And I think it's a very good segue uh, to our next session where we're actually hearing from the implementers um, of, of some of these uh, re registers. So we have uh, excellent speakers. I'll pass to my brother, Theo um, of OGP, who will be taking us through, through the next session. Theo. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maureen, uh, and definitely thank you to the speakers uh, who just spoke. I think this is, I think they've given us a quite a very good, I mean, global and regional overview of, of where we are, where things are, and some of the key standards that we have uh, on beneficial ownership. And I think what is important, I think also now where we are now, is to hear from, from the you know, from the practitioners, the champions that are actually leading this particular work of rolling out, of implementing open gov, I mean, sorry, uh, beneficial ownership reforms. 
Uh, and I have three excellent speakers who who are amazing champions, both for you know working with our with our with our three organizations um, in Nigeria, in Ghana as well as Senegal. So um, I'm going to have three speakers. Uh, uh, Al Haji Abubakar, who's the Registered General and CEO of Corporate Affairs uh, Commission in Nigeria. We we'll also have Jemaima Oware, who is the Registrar, uh, G Registrar General uh, uh, in, in, um, in Ghana. And then we we'll also have uh, Badara Paye, who is the Deputy National Coordinator and Bureau Lead uh, in Senegal with the ITI. So those are the three speakers that, that, uh, that we are going to have a discussion with in the next couple of minutes. Uh, but I'm going to ask as they speak to please share your, uh, your questions, your comments in the chat box. And we'll try to make sure that, you know, we hopefully we'll be within time to, uh, to, to read those questions to the speakers uh, in terms of how they are doing it, how they are implementing uh, the beneficial ownership reforms in their country. So without wasting time, um, I just want to check if all my speakers are there. Are there all the speakers there? Is Abu Bakar there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, great. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm, uh, Abu Bakar, I'm going, I'm, I'm going to start with you. Um, just to, uh, you know, just hear your experience in terms of leading, you know, the implementation of beneficial ownership reforms in, in Nigeria. Um, and, and just telling us in terms of where things are at the moment with implementing beneficial ownership reforms. But also, I you know, tell us because when you you know across the board, there are so many challenges, both legal, practical, uh, and technical challenges that countries are facing in terms of implementing uh, beneficial ownership. So just tell us what is the you know what is the state of play, how things are going in Nigeria, what are the challenges that you face, you know, uh, in implementing these reforms, but also uh, how have you as as a country as 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 the CAC how you have. Uh, you know, uh, uh, dealt with these challenges as well, and how civil society has been instrumental in terms of you know dealing with those uh, uh, challenges. Over to you, Obaka. Okay, thank you, Tio, and uh, hello to everybody. Um, our journey started long ago. We had a challenge of lack of enable enabling legal framework to make for mandatory disclosure of beneficial ownership. Our president in 2016 gave a commitment during the London Corruption Summit that Nigeria was going to implement a publicly available register of beneficial ownership. We had to quickly start the process of amending the Companies and Allied Matters Act, which is the enabling law that provides for the registration of corporate entities in Nigeria. The amendment was achieved last year on the 7th of August last year, 2020, the president assented to the new bill. The process of gazetting because of the pandemic took some time in November of 2020. And we had to quickly start the process for its implementation. The legal framework is modeled after the United Kingdom concept of persons with significant control, but with a difference on the threshold. Whereas the UK threshold is 25%, Nigeria adopted a lower threshold of 5% of voting rights or shares. Or if anybody controls the appointment of majority of directors, or if any person that exerts any form of control or influence over the way and manner the company is managing, that person qualifies as a PSC and he must make that disclosure. The disclosure also extends to limited liability partnerships. The new Companies and Allied Matters Act has introduced for the registration of limited liability partnership, which was hitherto to unknown to our law. So the disclosure on PSC has been extended to cover limited liability partnerships. Since the 3rd of January, the commission started the implement, implementing the new law. We've started receiving information on PSCs since the 3rd of January of this year. And as we receive this information, we publish it on our website. The information of PSC is one of the few information that is available to the public at no cost. But we are publishing 
based on entity type. We don't have the open data format yet. And on that, we are collaborating with the open ownership. They are supporting us. In fact, the forms we are using for the disclosure were designed based on technical advice from the open ownership. And they are also, as mentioned by Lius, they are also supporting us on our data sets and data standards to make them in conformity with the open data format. And some of us may also be aware of the grant given to Nigeria under the OGP multi donor fund. We are still trying to access the grant. We have finished the documentation. So we are expecting that the grant will be utilized to support the full implementation as well as making the information available in data format. So this is what for every company registered from the 3rd of January, 2021, that, that company has to provide information on these PS at the point of registration. The disclosure will start that are that are filed and return between the law provides that the PSC must inform the company if he meets the threshold or if he qualifies as a PSC within seven days of gaining such qualification. And the company in turn has to notify the commission within 30 days for receipt of the information from the CS, the, the PSC. Immediately the information is received. Our system is now electronic end to end. So every information received, once it is confirmed, will immediately be published. On verification of data, this is one area that we have challenged. In the past, due to the absence of integration with some critical agencies, like our National Identity Card Management Agency and the Nigerian Immigration Service, we had instances where individual applicants submit form means of identification that may not necessarily be valid. So to address that challenge, we are working out a system that will integrate our own application to the National Identity Card Management Database. That is the data of all Nigerians that have been issued national identity cards that company. But if you are submitting information on the PSC, if it's an individual, will validate the information from the National Identity Card Database. Because the National Identity Card Database has biometric information about all the individuals that have been issued identity card. So these are one, some of the ways of ensuring the integrity of the information we are receiving. For non-Nigerians that are resident in Nigeria, they are also required to have the National Identity Card in Nigeria. So the respect of them will also insist that they must provide their National Identity Card number. For non-residents, will continue to rely on the data page of their international passports. The assumption is the company that is admitting them as shareholders should do the necessary check to ensure that the information they are given it are correct. If there are issues, then the company has to explain why it accepted information that were manifestly wrong. In addition to that, the law provides criminal sanctions for providing any information that is manifestly false or misleading to the commission. And that attracts a jail term of up to two years. Then if there is any delay in sending information about CACs, PSCs, the law provides for a daily default fine for every day during which that delay occurs. So this is our journey. We expect that by the time we have the grant, the data will be such that organizations like Open Ownership and all our stakeholders can access this information in open data format. But as I have said, as of today, if you go to our website, www.cac.gov.ng, and you click on public search, mention the name, if you know any company that is registered, from 3rd January to date, if you, may, if you put the name of that company. Hi, Abu Bakr, one more minute. Yes. Okay. So if you put the name of that company, it will show you 
the name, the address, the date of registration, and the registration of the number of the company. And there is a place where you can view persons with significant control the rest of that company. That information is available at no cost. So this is where we are. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And thank you for all the support and, 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 and guidance in our journey to this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abu Bakr. That, that's, that's very informative. And I think it really you know, shows how you know, the level of commitment of your team and, and, and bringing together everything in terms of driving this reform forward. Um, we'll come back to you, um, I think, uh, to just hear more about you know, how you have worked with, with, other, uh, with other registers, how you're bringing all this together uh, and, 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 and making sure that all the various departments, you did speak about the identity registration department and how you're working with them, but it would be good to hear how you're working with other uh, government departments and other stakeholders in terms of creating, you know, connecting uh, the registers to make sure that they speak to each other. But I want to go to, to Ghana. I think Ghana uh, is one country that is championing this and is quite far ahead in terms of actually having a register. And I'd want to hear from uh, Jemima in terms of um, uh, you know the journey of of Ghana in terms of you know how they got to uh, actually passing the Companies Act that brought that institutionalized beneficial ownership transparency in Ghana, but also in terms of how the development of the actual register has been. Uh, I think at a political level, but also at a technical level, how that you know it. it from the outside, it looks very smooth. And they would say, you know, it looks very smooth that it was quite smooth, but it would be good to hear the journey uh, uh, for the Registrar uh, General's Department in terms of the Companies Act, but also in terms of the actual uh, uh, creation of the, of, 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 the, of, the bio, of the Beneficial Ownership Public Register and how things are in terms of making the, the register itself quite uh, public. Jemima, are you there? Yeah, thank you, Theo. Um, uh, good morning to all our participants and uh, on behalf of my team, we are so privileged to be given an opportunity to share Ghana's experience. I must say that this topic is not quite an easy one. Uh, beneficial ownership was very new to us. Our government also went to commit to providing a beneficial ownership framework in London, the London Anti-Corruption Summit. And at that time, we had absolutely no idea of what was happening. We had started the repeal of the Companies Act 1963 to just make it more user-friendly. When we're informed by the civil society organizations that Ghana had committed to providing beneficial ownership uh, you know, a regime. So we quickly stopped that whole process, amended uh, the 1963 Act, uh, but it was not composite enough. And so what we did was we came back and incorporated the amendments uh, to the 1963 Act to this new Companies Act, which was passed in 2019 and assented to in August of 2019. But as we were going through this whole reform, remember that we needed to make sure that we were satisfying international obligations and uh, that the country had made and several commitments, not only at that summit, but to FATF, to EITI, to Global Forum, to OGP, to UNCAC, and that's just a number of them. We have to make sure that the New Companies Act addressed all those commitments. And uh, we also needed to show that this act will bring about corporate transparency, fight money laundering, corruption, tax evasion, make sure that we have a law that addresses all those issues. And so we were finally able to pass it, and I think that was good for us. But another issue was we had a register that could not capture data on beneficial owners. And that took quite some time. We had been put on the gray list by FATF and each, each month was a nightmare. Our government on our back. We wanted the uh, software upgraded to take you know, beneficial ownership information. Luckily, the software developers were able to do that. And so by the 1st of October, 2020, we were able to upgrade the electronic software to receive the beneficial ownership data. So what we did was we did a phased approach. 
we did a collection of data from the extractive industry. That was the pilot project. To ensure that we had it right. And in that process, we realized that some of the, uh, the organizations handling the extractive sector were providing companies as beneficial owners. So then we started, we needed to do sensitization, a lot, lots, lots of sensitization to get various bodies to understand what we even meant by who a beneficial owner was, who the ultimate owner was. And that helped a lot. We did open house, we brought the forms, we developed forms, we put it on our website. But let me say this, we were handheld by a group known as the Beneficial Ownership Strategic Support, BOSS. And they were funded by DFID. And so they handheld us, they helped us, to, they trained us, they uh, gave us insight to this whole beneficial ownership thing. We, they helped us to have standard operating procedures. They helped us to do guidelines. And then our own staff, they, we didn't, we, they didn't know what the whole, this whole thing was about. So we trained all our staff so that when people started coming in, they knew what to do. So as of 1st of January this year, any company that is registered in this country needs to have beneficial ownership data. And then we also put out a notice the same 1st January 2021, that by 30th of June of 2021, all existing companies also have to update the register with their beneficial owners. And so currently we've also informed them that sanctions are going to come out after 30th of June. I must say that they are not taking us serious. When I look at the number of companies that have, you know, come to give us that data, it's very few. What will happen is possibly when we kickstart the sanctions, that is when they will come. But if you go now, we have a, um, a portal. You can request for the beneficial ownership data. It is not free to uh, the general public. They pay a little fee because the software we are running is very expensive. But for competent authorities, it is free. It's accessible. Uh, the Financial Intelligence Center have a link to our database. And so all other competent authorities can access this data free and it's accessible. But uh, when we come to the agreeing of thresholds, we had lots of stakeholder engagement. And currently Ghana, for general, we have 20% for general businesses. For uh, extractive sector, high risk sectors, we are talking of insurance, banking, gaming, real estate, uh, that's 5%. When you come to the foreign politically exposed persons, 5%. But when you come to all the local politically exposed, any company that has a, a local politically exposed person in it is 0%. And so that is it for the thresholds for Ghana. And we, we did this in collaboration with Gaiti, the Ghana EITI. Uh, and then uh, we were able to, and they actually also helped us well with us when we're upgrading our software. And right now, uh, we are now finding our best ways of doing validation of our data because we have made it very clear that that kind of validation and verification has to be done by each company before they submit it to us. But we now have through the standard operating procedures, we're going to do a sampling of the data that we have collected after June. And then we'll collaborate with other legal uh, law enforcement agencies, as well as civil society organizations, as well as the competent authorities and, and com compare with the, the, them, whatever data they have on these companies to confirm that indeed they've supplied us with accurate data. This we know is gonna take time. And again, GIZ has also come on board and is gonna help us and train us to enable us very valid data. So this Ghanaian, it's a new thing, but we have not stopped sensitization. We continuously, have stakeholder workshops, bring in the various, the lawyers, we contacted the lawyers, the Ghana Bar Association, we contacted um, civil society organizations, um, secret company secretaries, just to let them understand. And on our website, we have quite a bit of information for people to read on. And we've put it out there that any challenges they have, we are available to assist them. So that is the journey of Ghana so far. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well within time, really appreciate it. Um, I think that's that's quite interesting. And 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 again, um, uh, while we, I'm going to the next speaker, but uh, Jemima, just think about if one another, you know, 
reformer from another country would come to you and ask one advice you would give that person in terms of how they can you know undertake beneficial ownership transparency reform just think about it as i go to the next speaker uh, i'll come back to you um just going to senegal um okay i'm going to bring in uh uh, Badara, who is working, who is the Deputy National uh, Coordinator and BOT Lead uh, uh, for Senegal EITI, just, just to hear from him, uh, you know, the important role that the, the EITI process in Senegal has, has played in terms of, you know, helping shape the beneficial ownership transparency discussion in, uh, in Senegal, but also helping to drive legal reforms. Uh, towards beneficial ownership uh, uh, disclosure uh, in, in, in Senegal. Um, and, and just to hear how, you know, the work that is happening in Senegal intends to, to make sure that, you know, it connects with, with the EITI uh, 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 model and adopt the standards of EITI. Uh, uh, Badara, over to you. I'll, I'll just give you about five minutes. Uh, my apologies, we are behind time. Thank you, Phil. I, I will speak uh, in, uh, in French to go to go faster. So, uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, je, vais, uh, je, vais, je vais travailler, essayer de, de vous parler du cas du Sénégal sur l'implémentation de l'exigence 2.5 de la norme ITE relative aux bénéficiaires effectifs. Nous, on a commencé par une étude, étude de, de faisabilité parce que il faut voir le cadre général du pays. Est-ce que c'est adapté à. Sorry, uh, sorry, can you, sorry. You can Sorry. hear me. Uh, the, the English interpretation is not coming in. Okay. Maybe I... is it is it sorted? It's okay. C'est bon. Okay. Please go ahead. You can go on and speak in French, Badara. Yes, you can voilà. continue in French. Donc, euh, on a fait une étude diagnostique sur la divulgation de la propriété effective en, en 2017, et ça nous a permis véritablement de voir tous les acteurs qui étaient concernés que ce soit le ministère de la Justice euh, où le registre de commerce est basé, que ce soit le ministère des Finances, que ce soit euh, les autres ministères qui étaient pertinents. Ça a été extrêmement intéressant parce que de cette, de cette partie-là, on a pu établir euh, un protocole avec le ministère de la Justice notamment, pour établir euh, le comité national et le ministère de la Justice, le ministère des Mines et du Pétrole, euh, une feuille de route commune pour faire avancer les réformes. Et l'option qui a été euh, prise en fin de compte, c'était d'avoir de, de, un décret euh, qui encadre la divulgation euh, des bénéficiaires effectifs au Sénégal. C'est euh, dans cette mouvance-là que le GMP au Sénégal a mis en place une commission euh, de divulgation euh, de la, des bénéficiaires effectifs et qui a travaillé de façon euh, régulière avec les, pour les méthodes de collecte, pour le formulaire de collecte de, des données, euh, également avec un partenaire technique qui est chargé de la base de données pour véritablement arriver. Maintenant, euh, actuellement, on a les greffiers euh, qui sont en formation aujourd'hui même, actuellement. Euh, C'est une formation que je vais rejoindre tout à l'heure pour la production. Donc, on est, on est tout à fait prêt pour la production. Euh, pour arriver à divulguer les données euh, sous peu. C'est euh, passé aussi par une séance euh, de sensibilisation des entreprises, des journalistes, de la société civile euh, et également des administrations qui ont besoin de ces données-là, parce que ce n'est pas seulement des données pour l'ITIE, mais l'objectif qui est visé dans le décret qui a été mis en place, c'est de voir sur toute la chaîne de valeur des industries extractives ceux qui interviennent, que vous soyez une société qui ait une, des droits, des licences dans le secteur minier ou pétrolier, mais également vos sous-traitants et les prestataires de services sont concernés par la déclaration de bénéficiaires effectifs. L'objectif qui est visé de façon ultime, c'est que ce soit euh, une application généralisée euh, dans tous les secteurs économiques. C'est actuellement ça qui est visé, mais on va commencer d'abord par le secteur euh, pétrolier et gazier qui représente le secteur extractif. Au moins, toutes les personnes physiques qui ont 2% directement ou indirectement des capitaux, des droits de vote ou d'autres moyens de contrôle sont considérées comme bénéficiaires effectifs. Donc, le threshold, il est, il est vraiment bas pour capter le, le maximum de personnes. Et euh, à la longue, je pense qu'on va arriver à avoir un nombre suffisant 
de, de, de visibilité, d'avoir une visibilité sur l'architecture la, la, des bénéficiaires effectifs dans le pays, parce que l'objectif euh, qui est derrière aussi, c'est la lutte contre la corruption, les flux financiers illicites, ce qui est un, un autre aspect qui est extrêmement important pour nos économies qui viennent euh, à peine de, de commencer à sortir de cette crise de, de la COVID, euh, crise économique qui s'en est suivie, en plus de la crise sanitaire. Donc, c'est un objectif euh, global pour le pays et c'est un objectif, je dirais, même euh, planétaire parce que toutes les économies euh, souffrent de ces euh, genres d'actions qui nuisent aux économies, que ce soit les flux financiers illicites, que ce soit euh, la corruption. Euh, on va continuer, nous, à faire la sensibilisation et à faire euh, aussi ce qui est lié à la, la, au renforcement de capacité, parce que c'est extrêmement important. Aujourd'hui, la session avec les greffiers du ministère de la Justice, on va poursuivre la même chose. On avait fait avec les journalistes, on va refaire pour véritablement voir comment analyser les données. Ça, c'est la prochaine étape. Je pense que euh, je vais m'en arrêter là pour le moment. Merci Théo. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, that that that's quite that's quite interesting, and I'm 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 told that we are we are very much behind time, uh, but I would like to just go back to the speakers, um, sort of in just two minutes. And I think I did ask, and I'll start with Abu Bakar, um, and in his experience, because we have reformers online who who want to uh, uh, implement beneficial ownership. Uh, 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 beneficial ownership transparency reform. What is the one advice that you would give them uh, on your based on the journey that you have experienced with Nigeria? And I would like all three speakers to just you know just share that in their experience. Just one example, one one advice that you would give um, uh, reformers and stakeholders that want to implement uh, beneficial ownership transparency reforms. Okay, thank you, Tio. You need all the knowledge that you require all the technical advice and all the support you require from different stakeholders. So this is very necessary. Uh, as I have said, we started long ago because from FATAF 40 plus recommendations to OGPA, EITI, we couldn't achieve much because of the absence of enabling legal framework. It took a lot of effort to get the law to be passed by the National Assembly. And the civil society played a very active role in getting that law passed and eventually assented to by the president. So as I've said, one, you need to understand the framework, you need to understand the concept, you need to share experiences with countries that have successfully implemented this, 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 this concept. So, so we've been able to get this far because one, we've gotten all the training. EITI has helped us. Open Ownership has sponsored us to different trainings, sponsored us to different conferences. And that has actually increased our capacity to deliver on this command. And we thank everybody for that. So first, do a proper diagnostic, understand what it means, get all the technical advice, carry all your stakeholders along because if you don't do that at the last minute, you may have a problem because the, le the legislative process started before 2020. We had the first bill that was even passed by the two national assemblies, but it wasn't assented to by the government at that time because of some issues. A fresh bill had to be, had to be presented. I could recall when Sanjay visited Nigeria, this was one of the issues he actually discussed. With the, attorney, with, with the attorney general of Nigeria. And that played a lot of impetus in getting the bill eventually assented to by the government. So this is my humble advice to all those that want to embark on this journey. Thank you. Th thank you very much. That's, that's, that's very, very good advice, uh, Abu Bakar. I really appreciate that. Um, Jemima, um, again, you know, wh what is the one advice um, uh, that you would give other reformers and other stakeholders who want to implement beneficial ownership in their country. But Jemima, I would also want you to just touch it, you know, in, in, the, in the two minutes that you have, you know, um, because I think a lot of people are curious in terms of how, you know, how the data, you know, is accessible to other, you know, to researchers, to civil society, 
uh, in other compliant uh, institutions in, in, in Ghana? Is, is it accessible uh, to those, to civil society and others as well? The data that, that you know, that, that the beneficial ownership data. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I've already mentioned that we were handheld by a more experienced uh, group to bring us where we are because it was a new area and that accelerated you know, where Ghana has re reached right now. And then secondly, we had political support. We had the president, the vice president, uh, the deputy minister of finance chairing the committee to ensure that Ghana complied with the fact of recommendation 24. That was very, very critical. And then the finance ministry made sure that we had funding to upgrade our software to enable us collect the data. Now, this, data, this software that has been upgraded currently, if you want uh, information on beneficial ownership, you would have to request it from the office. We'll give it to you. The second phase, which is allowing the public and civil society organizations and um, whoever is interested in this data to access it from our portal, by the end of June, that will be made available. Because we, were, we, were, we, were, we had to rush to get this in place by October. So the software developers did at least put that the central register in place for you to access it if you request it from our office. But electronically to get it from the portal by the end of June, anybody who wants to access it can be able to access it. Remember I said that for competent authorities and civil society organizations, it's going to be free and accessible. But for the general public such as banks and other bodies that are financially more sound than we are, you pay a little fee, but then you have access to it. And our law ensures us that you can have it. Currently, all competent authorities can have it. It's accessible to them through the FIC's Go AML. It's a software that is linked up with ours through an API. And so instantly they can have that data through the FIC's Go AML. So my advice is get the political commitment get funding, get somebody who's gone ahead of you to walk, to walk you through the process, because then you don't bring old castle to new, you don't bring in old, you know, you know, they know it already. They helped us to develop modules, make it very easy for people to understand BU. They helped us develop our forms. You know, all this was done by more experienced people than we, we were. And that's how come we have reached where we are. Thank you. Thank you, Jemima. What I'm hearing from both your, you know, yourself and, and Abu Bakr is political support, political leadership is key. And I hope, I hope others are hearing that. And now, final question to uh, Badara. Um, okay. What advice would you give you know, other EITI chapters um, in, 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 in other countries uh, in terms of you know, how, what, what is the one advice that would help them to make sure that uh, you know, benef the beneficial ownership transparency discussion goes beyond extractives, but becomes an important, you know, reform process that is mainstreamed across the country. Just, just one advice. Oui, en fait, il faut montrer déjà aux, aux, aux autres secteurs que il y a un besoin réel de collaboration avec uh, ITE et que c'est un outil qui est extrêmement intéressant. Par exemple, pour les impôts. Euh, le secteur extractif, c'est un petit secteur, par exemple, dans le cas de mon pays. Ça représente à peu près maximum 3% du, du, du GDP, du, du PIB. Euh, donc, les autres secteurs sont encore plus importants. Donc, ce qu'on peut réaliser en termes de lutte contre la corruption, de contrôle des flux financiers illicites, d'évasion fiscale, on peut d'ailleurs gagner plus dans les autres secteurs. Donc, je pense que déjà, nous, on a commencé les discussions avec le ministère des Finances dans ce sens et ils sont conscients une fois que la réussite sera annoncée dans le secteur extractif, ce sera facile à dupliquer dans les autres secteurs. Et comme l'a dit mes prédécesseurs, il faut un strong leadership, c'est-à-dire qu'il faut quelqu'un, un champion national. Et souvent, le président de la République, nous, dans notre cas, depuis la conférence de l'ITIE à Dakar sur la propriété effective, s'est engagé pleinement à soutenir le processus. Et c'est ce qu'il nous faut dans un premier temps, parce que la partie technique, la mise en place des bases de données est assez facile, mais c'est le commitment, c'est l'engagement et le suivi pour la mise en œuvre qui est le plus important. Thank you very much. What I'm hearing is 
collaboration, collaboration, collaboration is very key. Um, uh, uh, I think we've come to the end of, 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 of this session. Uh, I would like to thank all three speakers uh, that have shared the experience. I, I, I see so many of the questions that people have asked, unfortunately, because of time, we couldn't get to those questions. But I will ask the speakers, you know, to, to take the time during the, the break, you know, during the break to answer some of the questions that have been asked, uh, uh, that have been asked. But also, I think also it's an opportunity for us to connect. We can always, you know, connect you with some of the speakers so that you can, you know, ask more questions in terms of the experience. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm told that I now have to hand over to Karabo, we'll, who will take us to the next to the next session. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, 26, so we can proceed now. Um, thank you once again uh, for, for joining this session. Um, and as Karabo said, if you would be happy to join the, um, the session on data collection uh, and verification, please do click on the link in the chat to join that session. And, and we will convene here um, in 45 minutes. So we have about 45 minutes for this session. Uh, and, and as you have seen throughout the session, and for those who managed to join us yesterday, uh, we've been discussing from very high level, um, um, uh, high level and political discussions uh, with different stakeholders. And then today we came in with some global perspectives and some key steps that we can take along. Uh, we've had some country experiences from Ghana, Nigeria, and Senegal. And we, as you see, we are sort of digging much deeper and deeper. And we are at this stage where we want to even dig more deeper to listen to you who, who will be and who are the implementation, implementers within the various countries. So we believe that this session is supposed to be very, very interactive. So please feel free um, to use both the chat box and also use um, the discussion session. Um, there will be uh, a brief uh, sort of introduction from myself uh, and, and Karabo. Karabo will kick off. Uh, we'll share some lessons from EITI and, and open ownership. And then we'll transition to the discussion where we'll be happy to hear from you. We also have some implementers within our midst that would also be coming with some interventions. Um, and then finally, for those who speak uh, uh, French, uh, please do use um, the, the, there is a button down there where you can change uh, uh, for interpretation and listen to, to the submissions in French. And of course you do so when uh, there's a French speaker to listen to the interpretation in English. Um, you can see on the screen uh, at some three questions that we want to highlight for you to have a reflection on. Um, and you can think of these and share some reflections uh, in the chat or when we come back to, to the conversations um, later on. But basically what we want to hear from you uh, is what has been the approach that your country has taken or that you are considering to take within uh, your countries when it comes to developing uh, the requisite legal framework um, that would necessitate beneficial national disclosure within your country. So for example, I, uh, similar to uh, conversations from Nigeria, Ghana, are you considering amending existing laws or are you developing new laws and regulations for BU? Um, and what lessons are you picking up from other jurisdictions who have implemented this uh, beneficial ownership so far? And the second question we also want you to have a reflection about is, what has been some of the challenges that you faced um, and questions that you have when it comes to uh, addressing these uh, legal obstacles that many countries have faced and many countries have also uh, been able to uh, overcome in terms of legal approaches to BIO. And finally, we would also want to hear um, if there's anything that your country can do to improve um, or start designing the legal uh, framework for beneficial ownership. So please do have some thoughts around this and share some initial observations in the chat or um, let's come back to that in, in, the, in the second uh, when we begin the conversation. So without much ado, I would um, hand over to my colleague uh, Karabo who will take us through uh, some of the considerations in designing um, beneficial ownership uh, legal frameworks. Karabo, over to you. There we go. So in designing a legal framework for beneficial ownership transparency, there are a few considerations even before getting into the process of developing the, the legislative framework. 
There is the pre-stage, which, for example, may include thinking through what the legislation or regulations, what is the required legislation or regulations for beneficial ownership transparency. And this, in, this may involve doing a gap analysis of the existing legislative framework to really identify where the gaps are and how the new law may address those gaps or integrate already existing provisions. The second, and this is really vital for um, wider political buy-in, as well as ensuring that the register itself meets its intended purposes, is to identify which stakeholders, agencies, or government departments should be involved in developing the legal framework, and also thinking through how to involve them throughout the process. I think we, for example, heard from the, the implementers in Ghana and Nigeria about how they engage with different sectors in developing their, their beneficial ownership registers. And then finally, and very critically, it's important to really think who the users of the beneficial ownership register, register are up front, um, as well as throughout the process of designing the legal framework. This is important because this will ensure that when the register or the legal framework is designed, it's done in a way that makes it user friendly. And this will have an impact, for example, on ensuring that those who are required to submit data are able to do so in a, in a manner which is user friendly, or for those who, are required, who desire to get access to their data, that it really suits their needs. So make sure that the register itself has users in mind. There's other things which can be considered, as for example, um, how the legal framework thinks about enabling open beneficial ownership data, um, thinking through how the provisions will be compatible with existing or future policy around data protection. Thinking through whether thinking through whether the legislative framework as a design meets the requirements for international standards such as the such as FATA for UNCAC or the EITR requirement, as well as really embedding um, systems around verifying data in the legal framework and thinking through what um, sanctions and enforcement mechanisms can be put in place. Open ownership has consolidated lots of these considerations into the principles which we heard about earlier today, and these can serve as a guide for thinking through what these and other considerations at this this pre point um, in developing the legislative framework. I want to hand over quickly to Edwin to talk through EITI's guidance in relation to this as well. Thank you very much, Karabu. And, and uh, for the sake of this discussion, and since we want to ignite more, more discussions, you've really covered most part of uh, sort of the, the lessons that we also share to most of our implementing countries. Um, the two, two things that I would like to highlight in addition um, is provisions around politically exposed persons, which is also one aspect of, of beneficial ownership disclosure that uh, countries would have to consider in, in um, developing their legal approaches. And when we talk about politically exposed persons or PEPs, we're looking at um, officials, high level officials that uh, have power to influence decisions within countries. So we're looking at head of states, for example, uh, we're looking at um, ministers, we're looking at members of parliament. And in some countries um, like Sierra Leone, Liberia, there's been considerations around even a traditional authority. So for example, chieftains institution and, and how those uh, leaders might also be playing a role uh, in, in the sectors, in the economic sectors within the country, covering uh, their dis beneficial ownership disclosures as well under politically exposed person. Um, one other area that uh, is good to consider in, in this legal approaches uh, is also about data timeliness and data retention. So what is the policy of those countries um, when it comes to how long do you keep um, old information? So where there has been changes to a beneficial ownership information in country A, for example, how long do you keep that information so that we can have access to, uh, authorities can have access to previous data. So that really, that sort of thinking around your data retention policies is extremely important. And again, on data timeliness, uh, how often is it necessary for, for reporters or for companies to update their beneficial ownership information? Some would do that uh, quarterly in their uh, quarterly filings. Some would also do that uh, yearly, for example. So these are some of the considerations that I'd like to add to your point, Karabo, um, to cover. So over to you again. Thanks. Thank, thank you so much, Edwin. So the next the next point we wanted to talk through is the actual the actual legal framework itself. 
the first thing to bear in mind is that a legal definition of beneficial ownership and its, and its thresholds forms a foundation of any disclosure regime when it's being designed. It's important because having a good legal definition is one of the key enablers of beneficial ownership transparency achieving its policy impact. Doing this comprehensively makes sure that the regime itself is less vulnerable to exploitation of the dis disclosure system, but also ensures that ultimately you have quality, quality and useful data um, at the end of the process. So what does this look like? Well, the first thing is that the beneficial ownership, the beneficial owner needs to be a natural person. And this may seem obvious, but there are some jurisdictions who still don't meet this requirement. For example, in a 2019 survey of, of the extractive sector, um, seven out of 16 countries did not meet this requirement have, of having a natural person being identified as a benef beneficial owner. The second thing is that a benef beneficial ownership, the beneficial owner should cover both ownership as well as control, as well as indirect ownership, as well as indirect control. The third part is, or the third, the third element that a legal definition ha should have is that the definition should have, should be, should be a catch-all definition. And this is important because it means that as the risks change in relation to beneficial, owner, beneficial ownership, then the risks are adequately provided for because the definition, definition itself is broad enough to ensure that with changing times and changing risk criteria, the definition itself is robust enough to, to suit those different requirements. It's also important to consider where there might be multiple definitions of beneficial ownership, beneficial ownership in various legal frameworks. So for example, if a country already has a definition of beneficial ownership in its anti-money laundering legislation, to the extent to which it is possible, these definitions should be harmonized to, to avoid conflicting reporting obligations. And then finally, it's useful to ensure that low thresholds are, are put in place as low thresholds for ownership as well as control are put in place to reduce the risk that someone might use the relevant ownership or control threshold to allow themselves to, to be hidden. So for example, if the disclosure threshold is 30%, um, there's a much higher chance that those under just below 30% will try and use that higher threshold to, to obscure the fact that they are the beneficial owner, whereas a much lower threshold reduces the risk of that happening and increases the costs of those trying to use a higher threshold to, to obscure their ownership pattern. In the next slide, <clears throat> we also we say that the, the definition should be not only robust, but it should be comprehensive. And what does this mean? Well, Bob, this would mean that all relevant legal entities as well as arrangements and all relevant natural persons should be included in the disclosure where it is a full economy register. If there are any exemption, exemptions which are defined in the law itself, these should be clearly defined as well as justified. For example, we see that in several jurisdictions, publicly listed companies are commonly exempted. And in this instance, this should be clearly defined and justified. Or the, it should, there, should be, um, there should be assurance that should, the, should there be, a, be an exemption that this type of data is being collected elsewhere to comparable levels of quality as well as access. We heard earlier today that privacy and protecting personal information is a key, is a key consideration. And it is possible to design a, leg a legal framework which takes into consideration the need for, for um, data protection versus the need for public disclosure. The way to do this is through creating something of a, a shielding regime to protect natural persons who are seriously at risk um, by disclosure of their data, but this should be both proportionate as well as just justified, and this should be based on a robust risk assessment, so this isn't used as a loophole to uh, avoid disclosure requirements. And then finally, another thing to consider at the legislative stage is thinking through just how much information is required to be disclosed about the intermediate companies as well as entities who might be um, part of the full ownership chain. Moving to our second to last slide, the way to understand which entities should be part of the disclosure regime, sometimes having using um, diagrams as well as visualizations is a very handy way in order to understand exactly what the legislative or what the legal framework is actually asking to be disclosed or what data is actually being collected. So we say that it's helpful to design the legal framework thinking about data with data in mind. 
and it's also useful to use diagrams or visual tools to explain to stakeholders the implications of particular of the particular regime or the or understand the implications of particular choices which are being made tools such as the diagram that you see on the screen right now um, so tools such as the corporate ownership diagrams as well as the models of the final data disclosure and the different policy choices can help engage stakeholders Diagrams like this can also be used together with a beneficial ownership visualization system and are a really useful way to show the different choices about the disclosure regime and the way in which data will finally be produced and, and can be used for different purposes. In the example that you see here on the screen, it's a disclosure framework to identify who the declaring entity will be for a beneficial ownership uh, regime. And what it, what it shows here is that all the different entities who are part of the disclosure regime will be required to report to the central register. But what it also shows where there's a slightly grayer tone is that there's certain entities sort of the middle of the chain who aren't required to be either captured in um, the legislative framework and don't require, don't have a, an obligation to disclose their data. So in this way, I think it's a very useful, we've got several tools which can assist with this particular process, but I think having a visual example of what exactly are, what, what the legal framework has put in place is a very useful way to check that there aren't any loopholes which weren't identified by purely just having this as a written document, which some stakeholders may not have the same degree of understanding. I'm going to hand back to Edwin to talk through some of the other resources which can be referenced in designing a legislative framework. Sorry, um, I'm still back to being an old man uh, that uh, forgets to unmute, but now I hope you can hear me very well. Can you confirm if you can hear me, uh, Karabo? I can hear you well, yes. Perfect. Um, yes, so um, we there, there's some tools that we will be sharing in the chat that uh, are highlighted here. Uh, for your for ease of reference, um, but basically these are tools developed by both o o Open Ownership and EITI. Uh, most of the conversations um, and the points raised by Karabo in her submission um, are, are detailed in this uh, principle for effective beneficial ownership uh, disclosure, uh, which you can see the link there. Um, there's also another good publication on uh, definitions and thresholds when it comes to BU, which will be very relevant. Uh, for, for stakeholders uh, joining us here. Um, at EITI, we also did a review on the approaches taken by uh, over 16, about 16 countries uh, on, on beneficial ownership uh, legal approaches. And, and the summaries and findings on that, uh, covering on thresholds, covering on definitions, competent authorities, and other important subjects, uh, you can see that in that link as well. And then we have, of course, uh, our guidance notes that we share uh, with our implementing countries on how to plan and transition towards a beneficial ownership disclosure, including developing a roadmap uh, uh, in that regard. And then finally, we also have a publication on effective consultation processes when it comes to leading BOT reforms within countries. Um, so we will share this in the chat box um, for, for your information and also in our post uh, webinar uh, package to you. So um, at this stage, uh, we will be moving on to, to the open floor for the questions and answers uh, so that we can hear from you as well. Um, and we, we do have some speakers that will be keen to come in here, but uh, let me first open the floor. Uh, you've heard a lot from us, but are there any quick submissions from anyone on the line on any of the topics we have been discussing so far? Um, this is this is Daniel here from Freetown, Sierra Leone. It's been it's been great um, um, conversation on this um, topic. But quickly, um, Edwin, one of the things which um, we in Sierra Leone are still grappling with is this question of politically exposed persons. Um, you you mentioned a wide range of uh, people who are readily or who readily come come to mind, um, the president, ministers, etc. But then you, you start to think of um, powers behind the throne that you would normally not know. Um, people would call kingmakers, for example. 
people would have access to, to the, the political leadership who are really could be the, 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 the frontiers, if you, you, you may. Um, um, how do you deal with that? Some of them you would know as friends of um, ministers or presidents, but, or family members even. So the question is, where, where do we start and where do we end with politically exposed process? Because the, the, the term itself, politically exposed, refer to people who would have some substantial influence within the political corridor. Um, say siblings of um, presidents or ministers, spouses, and not or even friends, you know, you might know them in society because you know during campaigns the role that they play, but they go into obscurity when elections are over, and then the, the victor is, is ruling, and then you know they, they, they carry out weight. But it's a bit difficult to bring them within the bigger regime because they are citizens. That's the first question. How do you deal with that? The second question is dealing with um, how do you um, um, synchronize uh, beneficial ownership disclosure, access to the data register, and also um, uh, privacy laws, you know, um, laws that protect um, private citizens from, from exposure. How do you marry these two things? So these are some of the challenges we are having actually in Sierra Leone and that well, we are grappling with even as we try to implement um, um, the BO. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Uh, is there any other question that we can take on and then uh, we can respond to them? And of course, uh, this is all together. So if there's anyone who also wants to respond uh, to some of the questions that um, Daniel has, for example, some practical examples from, from Ghana, for example, Nigeria, uh, before we come in, please feel free to also do so. Um, that's exactly the purpose of these uh, conversations. But is there any other um, uh, submission um, from from participants on, on this group? Yes, there's a submission. Please go from ahead. Uganda. Uh, we are currently reforming our uh, Companies Act, and uh, we intend to have uh, uh, regulations to operationalize those provisions in the law. Uh, the, the greatest challenge I foresee is funding, and uh, we're lucky to have the uh, Uganda. ITI Secretariat, uh, which we hope will support us. I work with the company's registry, Uganda Registration Services Bureau. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. So. Um, do we have anyone else on the line? Um, hello, Edwin. Yes, Bash, please go ahead. Uh, okay, yeah, good afternoon to you all. I think um, um, for, for Ghana, uh, like uh, the Registrar General mentioned, some progress has been made. Uh, however, um, in fact, uh, the practical experience that, uh, that we have or want to share from uh, Ghana yet uh, in terms of uh, beneficial ownership information uh, disclosure is that uh, what, when we're preparing the, uh, our last report, what we, we try as much as possible to capture information on uh, beneficial ownership. Of course, um, uh, what we realized or experienced is that some of the companies indeed were providing information of their legal owners and instead of uh, natural persons or the real persons or uh, who are behind the, the companies. So I, I think uh, one of the issues that we uh, realized was that we need uh, to actually intensify the sensitization. So uh, it was even on the basis of that, that uh, um, the sensitization program I mean, it was recrafted by the registrar general to make sure that they reach out to all the key stakeholders. Of course, uh, we also realized that uh, for the extractive sector, um, one of the questions uh, that came up was that in terms of threshold, uh, because uh, we 
in Ghana wanted, I mean, we piloted the beneficial ownership disclosure uh, process using the extractive sector. Uh, the issue of threshold was very important because um, you cannot um, uh, use a single threshold for all the, um, you know, the sectors. Uh, we are using economy-wide, economy, uh, economy -wide, um, what do you call it, a sector. For instance, um, in the extractive sector, the threshold is very low because we think that nominal uh, numbers in terms of the figures uh, when you look at them from the, even 1% is quite a lot of um, uh, money or funds, if you like. So uh, countries which are, are looking at uh, developing treasure should be mindful of the fact that uh, some of the stakeholders will definitely want to be pushing for highest uh, threshold. But for you to be able to make a uh, meaningful um, impact in terms of your BO disclosure process. You need to actually settle on a very low threshold, especially based on the risk assessment that uh, we conducted uh, in Ghana in terms of illicit financial flows, in terms of even, uh, what do you call it? But uh, all the risk factors associated with the extractive sector, the banking and the insurance sector. So um, I, I will also uh, end here, and maybe if uh, another opportunity comes, then I'll come in again, so that other people have opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bash. And those were very spot on and a very good segue to um, the next question. We'll be responding to the earlier questions in, in a bit, but uh, we do have with us also uh, Shigadi uh, Mwakoi, uh, who is the deputy registrar from, from the Business Registration Services uh, in Kenya, um, who uh, will be happy to, to hear from her as well. So we, we know that um, from Kenya, you have developed uh, your legal uh, framework, similar to what Bash has just said from Ghana, um, which covers sort of the economy-wide um, uh, sector. So not very limited, not just limited to one sector, but covering the whole sector. And that you also have your bio register life uh, here uh, in Kenya. We want to understand from you, um, how did Kenya approach this this process of defining who is a beneficial owner, um, which which legal entities uh, would discover, um, and and what threshold would be required? How I mean, it touches a bit on what Bash has mentioned and some of the questions we have. But uh, if you could come in, uh, Miss Muakoi, um, we'll be very happy to hear your submissions around these areas. Uh, thank you so much. I'll try and be as brief as possible because I'm required somewhere else. But uh, for Kenya, we were guided by the FATF, um, 24, Article 24 and 25. And so, however, when, when, when we looked at what we have uh, under the Capital Markets Authority, I think the threshold uh, is 15. And somewhere in our Articles of Association, we have a 5% uh, threshold. And so, as a multi-agency, we sat and, and, and decided that 10% is the uh, threshold within which we require someone to disclose their bio. So if you have 10% of shares, 10% voting rights, then we require you to disclose who your beneficial owner of that particular company are. And then just um, uh, maybe I can just give a, a, a snapshot of where we are since I have this opportunity. We were able to... Um, on board uh, most of the companies, particularly the companies that were uh, are registering now as of 13th October uh, 2020, we have the full information about their beneficial owners. And now for the historical ones, we began the process then and we have a deadline of 31st July within which we is to have updated their information about their BO. It's, it's, it's not an easy journey but uh, we are trusting that we'll get there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Mokoi. Um, those are very good and, and very spot on. Uh, we also have in our midst um, someone from South Africa um, as well. And, and there we've also been following the process, particularly from uh, open ownership side. And, and our understanding is that there has also been an existing uh, definition of beneficial ownership, um, which is now uh, life. And then there's a process ongoing uh, in terms of drafting the legal framework necessary for a full economy-wide 
public register. We want to hear from, from you uh, what has been also, again, your approach when it comes to designing this uh, legal framework. I think we have somebody from uh, Liz Van School uh, from South Africa. If you can unmute and, and make your submission. Uh, Edwin, I don't, Lizzie is not with us currently. So unless there's somebody else from South Africa who would like to speak to the, the, the legislative, uh, legislative design process, we can continue the discussion. Is there anybody from South Africa that would like to share um, that perspective? Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, this is Isaac Kabini from South Africa. Can you be able to hear me? Am I audible enough? Very well. We can hear you. If you can make a brief submission, that would be great. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, regarding that, uh, we we conducted the national risk assessment where we wanted to check the legal framework that we are having regarding the definition of uh, beneficial ownership. So uh, there is a, an agreed definition. So we've got a, a legislative framework that is in place. I think Liz uh, van Skor is uh, with the institution that is uh, mandated to come up with that uh, definition and the legislation. So the legislation has been approved by parliament. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you very, very much. Um, do we have any anyone? We've not had much Francophone uh, voice so far. Um, uh, Badara Paye was very great in, in making a submission um, in, in the beginning, in the plenary. Uh, do we have any other Francophone speaker that would want to come in, share some perspective from, from any Francophone country when it comes to uh, developing legal approaches? Okay, we do not have anyone um, now, but I am. I can try to kick off with one of the questions that was asked, and then my colleague Karabo, you can also respond. Okay, we have somebody, um, Deborah. Um, Marie, can you help to unmute uh, Deborah, or if you can unmute yourself, Deborah Port Louis, that would be great, and you can make your submission. Hi, um, good afternoon on my side from Seychelles. Um, I'm from the Seychelles Financial Intelligence Unit, and uh, just like to share a bit the experience of Seychelles when it comes to beneficial ownership. So essentially what we have in Seychelles, um, because we have both the offshore sector that plays a great role, and then we have the domestic sector, um, what we decided to do because of the various issues surrounding BO, Seychelles has, um, in August 2020, we enacted the Beneficial Ownership Act, which caters for all legal person and all legal arrangement created within the jurisdiction. And in that legislation, we've done our regulations as well. And the threshold for legal person is 10%. And for legal arrangement, we do not have um, any threshold. It covers all entities, partnership, foundation, and all. And um, I suppose uh, some of the constraints we, we face now is uh, in terms of the legal framework, we are more or less on par. And what we did, we kind of did that whole process of reforming our sector through our national AML safety committee, which consists of various institutions from the Ministry of Finance to um, uh, the Central Bank of Seychelles to the Financial Services Authority, and also in close consultation with the, the, the private sector. And what we have right now, the law is enacted, is in full force. And one added feature to our law is that the um, um, the the, the um, register of BO is maintained with the legal person, but the FIU also has a database which contain all the information um, on all entities um, registered in Seychelles. And I suppose the, the main challenge now is in the actual, actual implementation. And also, I suppose one of the challenges that um, most countries would face 
is in regards to validation of, of, of information that's maintained in that um, database. As you can appreciate, having a public register, it's, it's great, but it doesn't mean that information is necessarily correct or, or and there, there is a validation that the OECD, FATF, there, there is a discussion happening right now. So I think one uh, word of advice is for us to not think about just having that legal framework, but to think in terms of the um, practical implementation of that, that legal framework. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah. Um, we yeah. do have about 10 minutes to, to wrap up. So in a bit, I'll be calling my, my colleague um, to, to respond um, to, to some of the questions, but I will take one. And then if there are also other participants that want to, to respond, that would be great. We do have one question for Francophone and we'll be coming um, to that in a bit. Um, so on the question on how do you reconcile privacy uh, concerns and, and confidentiality clauses? And we've seen this uh, from at least from an EITF point of view um, in terms of the, the review that we've done, there are many cases where there are legitimate concerns around um, uh, privacy. And there are also some uh, confidentiality clauses uh, in right to information bills, for example. Um, and what is necessary when defining these um, uh, BO approaches is having a review of those, uh, sort of those uh, confidentiality provisions and those legitimate, uh, legitimate um, uh, concerns around privacy and seeing which of these are legitimate and which of these uh, might actually be used um, by perpetrators um, when, for some beneficial ownership when it comes to misusing that, that space uh, and clarifying your laws to capture those uh, privacy concerns. So what many countries have done and, and what EITI, for example, requires is some basic information uh, that should be published. So there is a group, of, there is a wide range of information on identity and, and other details that needs to be collected altogether. And out of those that are collected, uh, you have Registrar General's Department and other corporate affairs commissions uh, seeing those and saying that out of this numerous information we have on, on a beneficial ownership, we will publish some of them and we will also not publish some of them because of privacy concerns. Uh, so doing that sort of analysis, um, another way of also doing so is that there are, for example, children and, and uh, other minorities um, that might be uh, might be susceptible to abuse when information is published on them, for example. So doing that sort of uh, a sensitivity analysis to understand what would be necessary to collect as a base and what would be necessary and, and as a minimum necessary uh, to disclose. That sort of analysis will be very good uh, to do when preparing uh, your beneficial ownership uh, legal framework. Um, I don't know if my colleague Karabo would also want to touch on the other question on politically exposed person or on this question around privacy concerns. And then if there's somebody from implementers, I'm thinking Ghana, Nigeria, uh, who would also want to share their perspective on this. Thank you very much. Karabo, over to you. Thank you so much, Edwin. I want to almost swing it back to the implementing countries to maybe share their experience. I think Ghana, if I'm not mistaken, has taken the decision around um, how to identify politically exposed persons. So I'll be happy to, to hear how they're processing that. And um, the same with Seychelles, if I'm correct, Deborah, you have decided to reduce your disclosure threshold from 25% to 10%. And it might be useful to just quickly understand the, the rationale behind that maybe for other implementing countries to know um, what one of the principles is to really think about once you've designed a legal framework, there might be instances where you have to continuously improve it. So yeah, to maybe swing the questions back to our implementers. And Perfect. Like, uh, yeah. I think we have uh, Lisbeth or um, Domti from the Registrar General Department. Do you want to come in here? You can unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, hi. Hi, Edward. Um, this is Lisbeth. Um, yes, um, we've implemented our um, beneficial ownership laws, and of course that includes um, provisions on politically exposed persons. So um, as one of the things that have been mentioned already, your definitions must be as clear as possible, and it shouldn't be vague as, as far as um, is possible. So we use the FATA definition for politically exposed persons. We adopted that 
and to and using remodeling it to shoot our um, very instance in Ghana. And um, in the beginning, that particular provision was a little vague because some part of it was left out when the first amendment to the old law was done. And it excluded local politically exposed persons, which was a very huge um, vacuum that had been left because they were more targeted, um, if you like, than even foreign politically exposed persons. And then also, um, I think one, one of the contributors mentioned that um, it's important that a risk assessment is done so as to assess which areas are more risky and all that. And so um, um, doing a little research, we found that it's important that uh, politically exposed, especially local ones, are given a lower threshold than um, foreign politically exposed persons. So, for example, in Ghana, we have 5% for foreign politically exposed persons, and then for local politically exposed persons, we have a 0%. And it's also important to mention that um, your, your qualification as a foreign politically exposed person will touch more on what institution you work for, rather than what country you're a citizen of, so that um, by where you work, then there's likelihood of you having more influence if you went for a local institution as, as in one that belonged to Ghana. So that, that's the approach that we've had so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. We see the discussions is getting more and more exciting. You've made some very valuable points. I hope um, it addresses some of your questions, um, Daniel, and, and, and the first um, intervener. Um, I see that Odrago, if I pronounce your, your name well, um, you have your hands up. Please unmute and, and come in. You do have a question in the chat box. Merci. Bonjour à tous encore une fois. Merci pour uh, uh, ces brillants exposés. Et je voudrais effectivement partager un peu les efforts que le Burkina a pu faire uh, pour uh, améliorer son cadre juridique dans le cadre uh, uh, de, 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 de la sur les bénéficiaires effectifs. Alors, il faut dire que le Burkina Faso a fait partie des pays, des pays pilotes euh, euh, depuis 2015 au niveau de l'ICIE pour porter cette thématique. Et dans ce cadre, le pays a pu passer en revue l'ensemble du cadre juridique dans le pays. Le terre, je veux parler de la communauté économique euh, des États de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, a pu regarder Et à partir de cette étude, le comité de pilotage du Burkina Faso a réalisé une définition de la propriété effective et elle a fixé son taux à 25% plus 1 plus 25% des parts plus une action. Alors, sur cette base, les travaux ont continué, mais il faut dire que bien avant le pays déjà collecte, avant ce cadre totalement mis en place, le pays collecte des informations dans le cadre des rapports ITU et il, régulièrement, il, il sensibilise les entreprises sur la, le pays a introduit depuis 2000, en début de, en 2020 un projet De, 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 de décret sur, qui porte obligation euh, bénéficiaire effectif. Et ce décret a été adopté euh, en avril dernier um, par euh, le Conseil des ministres du Burkina Faso, ce qui montre l'engagement du, du pays en ce qui concerne la mise en œuvre de cette thématique, qu'elle est très, très importante dans le cadre de la lutte contre le blanchiment des capitaux et euh, la lutte contre le Thank you very much, uh, Odrago. Um, I would have to. I would have to. Alors aujourd'hui, ce qu'il reste est 
Yes. Wait. Yes. I would Wait. have to cut you here yes. because we are sorry. We have um, we have the other group rejoining us now. Thank you. Um, and we have the benefit of being in the plenary. But I would ask my colleague Ekarabo maybe to wrap up with a, a last word um, before we move to the next phase. Karabo, please over to you. Thank you so much, Edwin. I think it was really useful to hear some of the, the common patterns and trends around um, implementing, implementing the legislation and then having to do improvements or thinking about having to verify data, down, verify and validate data down the line. I am aware that we have been joined by the next group, so perhaps we can go into the next session. What we're going to do is frame this session talking about quality beneficial ownership information and listening to um, each other's experiences in developing systems to collect that good quality information. When we think about the um, pipeline of data of beneficial ownership information, we're looking at this input side here and getting the information from companies, from the individuals who represent those companies and thinking about whether we're using paper forms or web forms to collect that information, how we assure its quality. We don't want to talk too much today. We want to hear from people who've actually put in place these systems and what they've learned from doing that. So rather than thinking about what we mean by quality and the specific um, details of data. I want us to focus on what you can do because you have good quality data. So once you are collecting structured information with good identifiers for individuals and for companies, you can do things like make sure you are identifying the correct individuals. So quality information means making sure that you have different versions of people's names or previous names if people have changed their names. Perhaps publishing some information about birth year, birth month. We know there's sensitivities around publishing um, perhaps passport or national identifiers, but there's other ways of having good information about people. The other thing, once you have good quality beneficial ownership information, is that you will know the involvement of domestic companies and foreign entities in the ownership and control of companies and their operations in your country. Finally, most importantly, good quality information allows you to bring that together with other company declarations, perhaps with information from company registrars that are non-domestic, perhaps with information um, around contracting processes, whether that's in extractives or any sector, and even bringing it together with public declarations from public officials about their interests. And bringing that information together will give both civil society and government and the private sector the insights that they need to do their jobs and to, um, to, to hold people to account in the way that we need in our democracies. So that's why we need the good quality data. What we're going to do now is hear from two or three contributors about their experiences and how they, how they found it, what they would do differently if they could. Um, and I'm going to pass over to Christina to introduce our guests. After that, we will then open up discussion and people can share their experiences. Christina. Merci beaucoup, Kelly. Uh, si je peux me permettre de déjà um, commencer en français et pour introduire notre première contributeur, 
euh, du Sénégal. Euh, C'est M. Amadou Samb. Il est président de la Commission pour la mise en œuvre de la délibération des bénéficiaires effectifs au Sénégal. En, dans l'ITIE, il est membre du Collège de la Société civile et membre de l'Ordre national des experts comptables. And from Ghana, we will uh, hear from Domti Sarp Sarpong, who is the principal state attorney at the Registrar General's Department in Ghana. And she is part of a team that works closely with the Registrar General to lead implementation of beneficial ownership disclosure in Ghana. Monsieur Samb, la parole est à vous. Merci. Merci infiniment. Bonjour, bonjour Kelly, bonjour Christina. Je suis très heureux de participer à cette activité. Dans le cas du Sénégal, nous avons déjà entamé la mise en place du registre sur les bénéficiaires effectifs. Comme vous le savez, c'est un enjeu extrêmement important pour nous, puisque comme partout dans le monde, c'est un enjeu de lutte contre la corruption, lutte contre les flux financiers euh, illicites, mais également lutte contre l'évasion fiscale. Et euh, dans un contexte où, c'est vrai, aujourd'hui, les, les, les industries extractives ne représentent pas une grande portion de notre produit national brut, à peine 2 à 3 mais euh, nous sommes dans un contexte où ça va croître très rapidement, puisque nous sommes juste au début de l'exploitation euh, pétrolière et gazière. C'est donc très important dès à présent d'avoir un cadre qui permette de garantir la transparence des, des propriétés effectives. Euh, le, dès mars 2020, un texte, un décret a été le registre des bénéficiaires effectifs, euh, le loger déjà au ministère de la Justice. Euh, le placer sous la surveillance d'un juge et de greffier. Euh, C'est donc euh, la première démarche qui a été mise en place, un cadre donc pour le béné les bénéficiaires effectifs. Et euh, en avril 2020, nous avons euh, obtenu une première plateforme qui s'appelle un système COVID, qui a permis le dépôt de façon dématérialisée des déclarations sur les bénéficiaires effectifs. Étant membre de l'UTIE, cette obligation ne s'imposait à nous qu'en 2021 sur les données de 2020. Mais nous avons voulu le faire en 2020 sur les données de 2019 pour que ça puisse constituer un test. C'est ce que nous avons fait donc. Et euh, sur cette base-là, que nous avons, c'est d'ailleurs dans notre rapport UTIE 2019 euh, qui a été revu avec l'administrateur indépendant. Et sur cette base-là, nous avons obtenu 26 euh, déclarations, 26 sociétés qui ont soumis une déclaration, dont deux sont des sociétés d'État et 24 donc qui sont euh, des sociétés non étatiques. Et sur les 24 sociétés restantes, seules 16 sociétés nous ont communiqué des données exhaustives, des données aussi complètes qu'on le souhaitait, puisque déjà à l'époque, nous, nous avions conçu euh, de concert avec le ministère de la Justice euh, un formulaire de déclaration. Et dans le texte, dans le décret euh, de, 2000, de mars 2020, euh, il était prévu un arrêté qui allait euh, officialiser ce formulaire. Mais en attendant qu'il soit fait, nous, nous avons pris euh, les devants et nous avons travaillé avec ce formulaire-là. Et nous estimions que sur les 24 sociétés qui avaient soumis le formulaire de façon dématérialisée, seulement 16 nous avaient donné euh, nous avait fourni des données euh, exhaustives et de données qui avaient été signées par un représentant habilité. Euh, alors, qu'est-ce que nous ferions différemment aujourd'hui Eh bien, c'est ce que nous sommes en train de faire. Nous pensons que, vous savez, c'est assez nouveau la, la notion de bénéficiaire effectif, même si euh, le, la démarche a été longue pour définir c'est quoi le bénéficiaire effectif. Aujourd'hui, c'est fait dans nos textes de loi pour euh, définir c'est quoi une personne politiquement exposée. Aujourd'hui, c'est fait dans, dans, dans nos textes de loi. Ça a été relativement pratique. Ça a été que les gens travaillaient avec 
le propriétaire légal. Ils ne font pas suffisamment encore la différence entre le propriétaire légal et le bénéficiaire effectif, qui est la personne physique en dernière instance, qui, euh, qui bénéficie des, des, des avantages. Et euh, il, faut nous faire, il nous faut faire donc beaucoup de sensibilisation et beaucoup de formation. C'est ce que nous aurions fait différemment, mais nous avons déjà commencé à le faire. Et aujourd'hui, au moment où je vous parle, les greffiers sont en train d'être formés. Il y a une séance que je devrais rejoindre à la, à la fin de cette euh, séance euh, sur la formation des greffiers. Vous savez, les greffiers, ce sont les personnes qui, sous la supervision du juge, vont devoir tenir le public des bénéficiaires effectifs. vont devoir qu'on leur donne sont correctes, vont devoir les recouper avec d'autres informations. Et euh, je pense que c'est ce que nous aurions fait euh, différemment, mais nous sommes déjà en train euh, de, de le corriger en mettant en avant euh, la, la formation. Je dois dire que d'ailleurs, pendant la période Covid où nous ne pouvions pas nous rencontrer, nous avons déjà commencé des séances de formation de toutes les personnes, de toutes les parties prenantes. Nous avons fait une formation. Ben déjà des membres du, de l'ETE qui, qui, qui doivent comprendre les enjeux et euh, être les vecteurs euh, de, pour promouvoir la notion de bénéficiaire effectif dans le reste de la société. Nous avons fait la formation des journalistes, nous avons fait une première formation du personnel du ministère de la Justice. Aujourd'hui, c'est une formation spécifique des personnes qui vont devoir tenir le registre du béné des bénéficiaires effectifs qui va être ouvert au public sous certaines conditions et dans le respect des normes de la loi sur le respect des données personnelles. Voilà, je voudrais m'en tenir là pour l'instant et je me tiens à votre disposition s'il y a des questions complémentaires. Merci beaucoup pour ce partage d'expérience, M. Sam. Tout à fait, le Sénégal a fait beaucoup de travail de sensibilisation, surtout déjà aussi avec la société civile. Euh, ce qui est très intéressant parce que le moment où cette information sera publique, il y aura aussi vraiment des utilisateurs de ces données parce qu'il y aura une demande. Um, avec cela, uh, I would like to hand over to uh, Dante Sarpa to give you the floor. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I will just share a little bit about how we went about it. Um, so I'm addressing the question of what current system we are using. For now, since October um, 2020, we, we deployed our electronic register. That's the new one. But before then, we, we were using an Excel spreadsheet because we knew that we, we had to collect the data and we were not going to wait forever um, for the electronic register to be, um, to be built. So we started collecting the information um, by start doing a pilot with the extractive sector, because they already had um, an understanding of the requirements of the BU. Um, the BU. They needed to um, meet that requirement by January 20, 2020. So we decided to start with them and then um, collect uh, the information. So we, we, we used the form. We had to get a form. And the basis of our form was we, we adopted the one that the Ghana EITI was using in collecting their data because like my, um, the registrar said, we were new and we didn't even know how to go about it. So we adopted the EITI, Ghana EITI form. They had a form for collecting data. So they gave that to us and then we met with them several times. And, and then based on our law, we made modifications to it. And I must say that over time, we've, we've gone through several versions of the form. Because as you start doing it, we realize that the, um, the status is very complicated. You know, the data that goes in may be different from each um, requirement or each obligation. And that, therefore, um, we went through several. But now we have about four forms. We, 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 we have about four forms. We have the BO1, we have the BO2, BO3, and BO4. And then you ask me why. First, we realize that the form was becoming too bulky too bulky and complicated and people were complaining. So therefore we needed to look at the various um, type entities that will be um, submitting it. When we come to the companies, it's um, all companies needed to submit the information. And we have companies that are owned by government and therefore the requirements are definitely going to be 
different. We have the publicly listed companies. And therefore, we cannot bring all the owners on board. We, we, we can't even manage that. So we needed to get a different form for them. And then we have the main BO1, which is the declaration form that all companies need to declare because it's a declaration. You are declaring whether you have BOs or not. So that's the main overarching form that every company needed to fill. And then if they are you select whether you are individual, how many, how many individuals are on it, then you go to the BO2 and then you provide the information on the individual. So that's how we went, uh, went about it. Like I said, we did a pilot test. And then when we got the electronic register deployed, we did a phased approach. So we went back to the extractive because we had already started collecting with them the extra format. And in, even in collect, doing the pilot with them, we realized that they didn't understand. They were the information and the forms that were filled, it wasn't complete. They were all given, most people were giving us companies as the beneficial owners. And we all know that they are supposed to be individuals, the ultimate person behind it. So therefore we needed to do more education and sensitization. And then I mean, I mean, I mean the form and then have guidance notes and then training workshops on how to fill the form. We got the company secretaries, the lawyers, you know, we had an open house and then got all those who were involved, auditors, accountants, all those who um, were um, part of the company um, registration process. And then we went, we went to the second phase that was the high risk um, and then high, the financial and high risk like the um, gaming, financial sectors, insurance, um, real estate. Then we focused on, on them. We had training sessions for them. We had training of trainers and then they also brought on some, you know, more information. And then we also adapted, we made slight modifications to um, so like my boss said, since 2020, we started collecting the form. So we have four forms. When it comes to verification, it's a very um, <laughs> difficult or, you know, it's, it's not that simple, you know, because we've all also asked different, different company, um, countries how they do the verification. We noticed that when we are onboarding them, it's difficult to do the verification, but at least we do a validation. We've built a system that, um, makes it um, easy. We looked at the UK, um, um, how they went about it and how they found out the flaws. So we, we, when it comes to dates, we have a certain format. We use drop down menus to collect so that you select um, the information, maybe cities, you know, states, whatever um, type of thing so that we don't, we, we don't allow too much free entry, free, free text for you to, um, so um, we validate by making sure that the, the form is completely filled. There's enough information to identify who the BO is. And then we do some validation with the tax identification. We've connect, we, we, um, connected with the tax registries. So we verified the tax information. Well, everybody has a tax identification number. And now we've brought on board the national ID. So we do that. We get copies and then we, we validate that. But when it comes to for, that's for locals, but when it comes to foreign um, beneficial owners, it's difficult to you know go across country and then do that kind of verification. So um, we get um, a national issued ID, we request for a national issued ID, and then um, put on file. When the time comes for us to do any further verification, we'll probably use our, our links or whatever to. And then we, we know that. Um, We've put in place um, a system um, whereby we can do the um, verification in the future. We haven't started now, but we are collaborating with all the other competent authorities on how to come on a, a platform, um, one main platform, so that we can compare and share data because they might send one information to the registry and send another information to the vehicle registration or the lands commission. So we are doing that. We currently have having that kind of conversation and collaboration in that so um we, i think on our um work plan maybe in july after the deadline we, 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 we based on a risk-based approach we, we sample out some companies and then do some kind of verification to find out um how it's working so 
basically that's it. But what we we'll do differently has been a long road for us. We passed the law before we started thinking about, you know, about the forms and the regulations and all that. That's so it took us a long time. So I recommend that if anyone is doing that as you are thinking about the law, you need to be thinking about the regulations, the type of forms, and then involve everyone from private sector, not just the government, CSOs, for the private sector, they will be the users. Most of them will be the users. So um, I think we did we, we involved them, but not as much. It was after the law was passed, after we were doing the regulations that we started inviting them. So it became difficult. So I would recommend that um, private sector comes on board from day one. So basically, that's it. it is. And find the funding, uh, the funding. Make sure you have the funding before the law is passed, because you don't want to, we, our law was passed in 2016. We didn't start implementation to 2020. And, you know, if the funding, most of it was funding issues. So if you had the fund, funding available, you probably would have saved a lot of um, time. So thank you. That's my contribution. Thank you very much, uh, Dante, for that uh, intervention. Um, that was really also very interesting to see the, the challenges of really then going about the collection itself once all of the legal hurdles have been overcome. And we say um, that it, the form of collecting uh, the data is really where the reform hits the pavement. So really where it, it gets feet and starts walking and um, that this beginning phase can be very wobbly. Um, I wanted to go back to Mr. Somb just with a follow-up question. Mr. Somb, je veux m'intéresser uh, de vous demander de peut-être aussi élaborer sur quels sont les plans pour la méthode de collecte de données um, une fois que cet arrêté été mise en place. Est-ce que c'est avec euh, le greffier ou est-ce que vous allez continuer de le faire via l'ITE? Merci si vous pouvez juste euh, l'illustrer dans, dans quelques phrases. Merci. Merci infiniment. Merci infiniment pour cette question. Alors, ce qui va se faire euh, la officielle, ça va être c'est une infogreffe et euh, effectivement les, les déclarations vont être faites, vont être faites sur c'est une infogreffe. Et il va être important d'éviter la double déclaration. Donc, au niveau de l'ITIE, on ira copier les informations officielles sur un scène infogreffe et on les mettra dans Govin pour continuer à travailler. Euh, ça, c'est le premier élément. Le deuxième élément important, c'est que pour les gens qui ont euh, des difficultés, euh, ça peut exister dans, avec le secteur informel, euh, qui ont des difficultés, la plateforme Sénéphogreffe, ils ont la possibilité d'aller se placer devant le greffier et de faire la déclaration devant le greffier qui se chargera de les mettre dans la plateforme dématérialisée. Merci beaucoup. C'est vraiment intéressant que vous pensez aussi aux différents genres d'utilisateurs pour soumettre les données. Donc, vous Exactement. donnez l'option en personne, en papier et euh, aussi numérique. Exactement. C'est le ça numérique fait. qui est privilégié puisque dans toute la on fait en sorte que euh, les données soient dématérialisées pour qu'elles puissent se parler, pour qu'on puisse faire des comparaisons. Mais il faut tenir compte du fait que nous sommes dans, dans une évolution, dans, dans un processus. Il y a encore quelques personnes. Euh, il faut prévoir une petite phase de transition qui va être marginale, euh, mais voilà, il faut la prévoir. Merci beaucoup pour cette euh... Uh, addition d'information. Um, and with that, I will change back to English and uh, open the floor for uh, questions or comments from other uh, members who are in this breakout room to either share their experiences or to ask our contributors uh, questions. Please don't hesitate to uh, just raise your hand and we will call on you. Is that people are shy today? Uh, Lola, please, may I give you the floor? Sure, um, can you all hear me? Very well, yes. 
Yes. Excellent. Well, thank you so very much um, to the EITIOGP team and um, the other speakers, Open Society, and also from the uh, government, Senegal, Ghana, Nigeria. I'm not, I might be missing one other country, but pardon me. But um, thank you so much for your views. It's very heartening to hear about the progress that's been made on beneficial ownership transparency in these countries because I think you've overcome the hardest part, which is, you know, even passing the legislation to start with. And now you're at the difficult part, um, which is implementing it, right? And so my, um, not so much a question, but a point that I'll be talking about much later in the next session. And, you know, I just wonder if you have any thoughts on that. And if you're thinking that long-term yet, um, just to hear your views and, and the views of other um, folks on the, on the call. So it's with regard um, to what um, Amadou just talked about, which is, so we, we're trying to achieve fair competition um, in the private sector. Now, in countries where there has, there has recently been, um, or there is ongoing privatization, that's one um, opportunity for political, um, politically exposed people to gain access into, you know, ownership of, of formerly government held um, assets, right? And and we see how that really where in Nigeria, for instance, you know, in the power sector, um, that's really where there is, the, the problem gets created. Um, when companies get to bid for assets, a lot of times the local private sector in those countries, countries in Nigeria, for example, don't have the capacity and sophistication to bid to acquire those assets at that point. So what happens is foreign companies are able to bid for those assets and they need access. So they buy access with um, influence from public um, officials who then have um, ownership, what you call a carry in those businesses. So now the question is at what point do we as the government um, I'm not the government, but at what point do the organizations promoting BOT, beneficial ownership transparency in the countries, start to work strategically with the private sector so that the private sector's capacity to bid um, for these sorts of um, investment opportunities, the private sector's um, capacity to do that transparently is improved. And I'm talking about especially during deregularization processes, during privatization, at what point do we try to create fairness and competitiveness for local private sector folks? And of course, for foreign private sector folks coming in, uh, a strong um, sense of transparency so that at that point, you can curb the risk of you know, um, acquisition by connected, um, individuals or connected entities, because uh, that then you know leads to the monopolies that happens later. But you 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 want to curb it in the beginning. So just um, thinking about that, I wonder if you know the speakers have any thoughts about that or have experienced it. If your countries are going through um, a privatization process or, or deregularization um, in any um, sectors. Thank you so much, Lola, for that question and for sharing also your thoughts. I would suggest that we also take Ian's uh, comments and then turn back uh, for uh, unfortunately only one minute per contributor to respond so that we can um, leave you as well with a couple of thoughts before rejoining um, the main room in about 10 minutes time. So Ian, please, can I give you the floor? Christina, thanks a lot and uh, very interesting uh, discussion we're having here. Just a quick one. Um, I was wondering in terms of disclosure, disclosing the collected information, is all the information that is collected as indicated in the form disclosed publicly or do you choose a section of information? And I'll just, how do you do that? <laughs> how do you deal with any pushback? So I'm interested in that because uh, we are going through that ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can I just, uh, for responding to those both questions, um, hand over to Mrs. Somb first. 
s'il vous plaît, Monsieur Sombe. La parole est à vous. Merci infiniment. Merci. Euh, alors, pour la première question euh, de notre euh, collègue, euh, je voudrais dire que euh, la réponse, c'est tout ce que nous sommes en train de faire. C'est toutes les initiatives qui sont en train d'être prises pour divulguer euh, les, la propriété effective. Vous savez, le problème quand vous parlez de, de, de personnes politiquement exposées qui vont accéder à la propriété des actifs euh, et donc à la question des conflits d'intérêts que ça pose, je pense que la meilleure façon de lutter contre ça, c'est de faire en sorte qu'il y ait la transparence. Euh, et euh, tout ce que nous sommes en train de faire vise justement à lutter contre ces, ces phénomènes-là. Le problème, ce n'est pas, pas que le secteur privé soit, soit impliqué. Le problème, c'est que le secteur privé soit contrôlé par des personnes politiquement exposées qui se cachent derrière euh, parfois des prêtres ou derrière des sociétés pour réellement contrôler les actifs. Et c'est ça que nous sommes en train de lutter. Je pense que la meilleure réponse à votre question, c'est de continuer tout ce que nous sommes en train de faire à travers l'ITIE, à travers euh, Open Ownership, à travers tout ce qu'on réunit aujourd'hui. Je pense, à mon avis, à votre question. Alors, pour ce aux données, euh, chez nous au Sénégal, c'est euh, organisé. Euh, une personne peut demander l'accès, une personne physique ou morale peut demander à accéder aux informations, à la totalité des informations, à condition qu'elle demande, qu'elle fasse la demande au juge, il y a un juge qui est chargé de euh, surveiller le, euh, le registre des bénéficiaires effectifs et qu'elle justifie d'un intérêt légitime. Hein, déjà, ça c'est la première partie de l'accès. Ensuite, les structures euh, étatiques peuvent également accéder en totalité à cette information-là formation en totalité. Et je devrais dire que, par exemple, l'un des, des objectifs, c'est que les administrations fiscales puissent accéder en totalité à cette information également pour pouvoir lutter contre l'évasion fiscale. Voilà ce que je voulais dire donc sur la réponse à la deuxième question. Thank you very much, Mr. Sand. Um, may I hand over to Santi, please, to respond to the two questions. Yes, thank you very much. So if I understand the first question well, um, what I would say is, I mean, um, the bio information, it needs to be available, okay? The bio itself is not a means, it's not the end in itself, it's a means to an end. And therefore people should learn how to use that data, whichever way, right? Compared to, you, they should use that information to do due diligence, you know, whichever way, but we have to make sure that that information is available and therefore organizations, CSOs, whoever should be able to use it. So maybe we should be looking at how to use that information to satisfy whatever um, questions that we may have. Even the registry cannot do it all, but we have to make sure that the information is available, is current, is updated, that when people need it, they can, get that information timely to use it for whatever that they may have. We may not be able to do everything. When it comes to um, the privacy issues, for the information, we are going to collect everything. We make sure that you fill out the form, you provide all that information to us. But we don't, because people are worried about the privacy, the, this whole privacy issue, right? So we have to comply. There are laws in the country that requires us to comply by privacy issues. Um, on our website, even with the basic information, you can get some basic information for free. So when once we deploy the bio data um, on the online portal, when you go on, you can get some basic information for free. But then if you want more, then you may have to maybe um, be an account holder, you know, then use the system and then get the information. You can get um, all the necessary information, but not their personal data and all that. But when it comes to um, law enforcement, they get everything. They have access to all that information. Of course, they may need all the date of birth, you know, the residential address and stuff like that. But with um, regular um, people requesting for the information, we'll, let, we'll give you information, enough information for you to identify who the people is. So 
that's all that I can say for now. It's a work in progress. So, you know, whenever there's a need to make any changes, we are available to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, that response uh, to both contributors. Uh, thank you so much for those perspectives. Um, I would like to now um, hand over back to Katie to um, wrap up the session with a couple of um, thoughts to send you on your way on how you can go about to, in practical terms, in, to collect the high quality data. Thanks, Christina. Thank you very much to Dante and to Amdu as well. Um, fascinating to, to hear those insights. One thing that struck me about this, um, the, the concept of uh, collecting good quality information, Domti, you were talking about validation and technical things that we can do once we use electronic forms. Such a good point. And, and that's a very technical thing that we need to think about at that point. And also alongside um, what Amadu was saying about awareness raising, because people need to know what the very concept of a beneficial owner is so that it doesn't get confused with legal ownership. So we have these you know, very high conceptual um, things that need to be clarified for people at the point they come to give up their information, along with the technical things that we can do to um, make sure that that information is then well-structured well machine readable and you know consistent in its form um, so I thought that was really interesting to think about those two ends um, I also wanted to mention that when it comes to deciding what information is made public from declarations um, we know it's not easy um, countries are working this out as we go there's a couple of um, things that you might want to look at so Christina and I worked on the new iteration of the EITI um, template form. And we talked there about which fields and information we think should be made public, and then those that potentially would need to be more restricted. Um, so Simon has just posted into the chat links to these various resources please do check those out um, there's also a link there to the open ownership verification briefing a really useful um, report there which tackles verification from you know all the way from validation to um, oversight and um, investigation so those would be there the other um, resource that I have signposted you to is the one on effective consultation processes because I think um, Amadu and Domti both touched on this is the involvement of people when it comes to testing the forms um, and training and awareness raising so that again is quite an interesting um, overview of how to tackle that I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to thank everyone, especially our speakers um, and those asking questions. I'm sorry this was such a short session. I feel like we could talk so much about this. Um, yes, yeah, so we our, our group was on looking at the legal approaches to implementing beneficial ownership reforms, and we had quite a diverse range of implementing countries. I think some of the common patterns was one on what is the requirement, and I think there were a few comments about the importance of having a risk assessment to determine which legal entities are required for disclosure, or which sectors in particular should have a lower threshold for disclosure requirements. There was some useful guidance on thinking about how to, for example, um, incorporate inf information from domestic as 
versus foreign jurisdictions and um, some useful thinking around countries where there has been implementation already so for example in Kenya thinking about what's the next step around verifying them verifying and validating the data as well there are also other common challenges around the cost of impl implementation as well and how best to address that so I think it, it was very diverse and I think there is a commitment to share some of the findings and research and then I think a common challenge which came across which we are we've identified even at the earlier sessions was on how to resolve the well, the perceived tension between uh, the need to ensure data is protected versus the requirement to disclose data and how that should be provisioned in the legal framework. So thank you for giving us five minutes to give a very high level feedback to the group. Thanks, Cara. Going very quickly to Christina before we go to break. Thank you, Maureen. So our group uh, investigated the, the key uh, lessons learned for collecting high quality beneficial ownership data. And that is, of course, especially important because having high quality data allows you to fight financial crime to uh, ensure that public officials or people in power do not have uh, hold licenses and to also cross check data from other institutions or other sources. So it's really a highly important um, topic. And both Senegal and Ghana shared their experiences because they've already moved into the collection phase, which is really where the reform hits the ground, where we really start um, learning to implement uh, this. The main things that the speakers have highlighted is in the case of Senegal that training institutions and the public on what the differences between beneficial and legal owner, and how to verify that information is really key. And um, that this training is really ongoing, especially with the institutions to ensure that data is really properly verified. Also, um, that to think about different for, um, methods of submitting the information, because not everyone will feel uh, comfortable submitting the information online. So thinking of how can also people who want to submit it in paper to have different channels of doing so. In uh, the case of Ghana, there were lots of really also interesting aspects shared. And one of them that sprang out to me is that when they first rolled out data collection, they had four different forms and it was totally confusing. So they needed to really simplify that. Um, and, and also they've done a lot of work on verifying the information after it has been submitted. Our com the comments that came from the floor were uh, highlighted really how important Ask beneficial Christina yeah. to, to just finish in, in one minute, please. Yeah, the comments highlighted how important this data was in more in general for also the deregulization and privatization processes that are ongoing in countries. And also the challenge of deciding what information should be public and what is uh, just internal for admin purposes. Thanks. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. And thanks uh, to all uh, that are still here that are really contributing towards these rich discussions. Uh, we are now going to give you a 10 minute break before we come back with a really excellent session, really good speakers um, that can really inform our strategies um, around how to advance some of the things that we've been talking about. So we're going to go uh, to a 10 minute break. Uh, we'll be back uh, about 25 past the hour and we'll get into that session. So thank you so much and see you in. Excellent, so our next session um, is going to be led by uh, Chennai. Chennai, hopefully you're in the room and can hear us. I can hear you, Maureen. Excellent. So Chennai, please introduce the next uh, session and take us away. Awesome. Thanks, Maureen. I think just to add to some of the comments, this, this meeting definitely has had some of the best break time music <laughs> I've heard in a long time. Um, so, so I think to get started, thank you so much, uh, Maureen, for uh, facilitating what's been such an incredible, I think, past few hours. Um, I now have the privilege of um, moderating this current session. 
Um, essentially, this session will be looking to see the extent to which we can accelerate the implementation of using beneficial ownership data. So I think over the past couple of hours and to some extent, even yesterday, we covered some of the tools and strategies to transition from commitments to reforms um, and now to actual disclosure. And so particularly what this session is supposed to focus on is now trying to gauge what are some of the practical options to engage different stakeholders in the actual use of, of beneficial ownership data. Um, I'm excited about this panel because we have a diverse group um, of colleagues who will be joining me um, in this session. And so we will be hearing perspectives from uh, global actors, from government, from industry, and from civil society organizations. Um, just by way of quick introduction again, my name is Chennai and I work with the Tax Justice Network Africa. And we are so excited to be a part of this um, forum because we truly believe that if we can get beneficial ownership right, this can contribute to um, promoting revenue mobilization as well as curbing illicit financial flows. So in terms of the speakers uh, today, I have with me um, the policy director of global financial integrity, uh, Lakshmi Kumar. Um, I also have the policy advisor at the Ministry of Mines and Mineral Resources um, in Sierra Leone, and this is Daniel uh, Gibondo. I also have the Publish What You Pay Regional Coordinator for Francophone West Africa, Mr. Demba Seidi. Um, and then I also have a Senior Program Officer from the Africa Center for International Private Enterprise, Lola Adekanye. So I'm going to get us started um, by already asking um, Lakshmi. Um, essentially, Lakshmi will be giving uh, the global perspective to, to this question. So Lakshmi, my first question to you um, is how can quality uh, beneficial ownership, ownership transparency data help in addressing illicit financial flows, corruption, illicit trade, and money laundering both globally um, and in Africa? So I'm gonna be quite tight with, with time. So I'm gonna give you about five minutes to answer this and then I've got a follow up. So if you can give some of your quick thoughts on that, that would be great. Over to you, Lakshmi. Okay, um, no, thank you, Chennai. I, and I also just want to echo um, about, about how much I love the choice of music. You know, it's a good event when someone cares <laughs> enough about the music as well. Um, so in that sort of to talk about the impact that quality um, beneficial ownership data can have, I think the first thing for us when we sort of think about this is to sort of understand that the value of quality bio data is, is a reflection in how um, illicit uh, methodologies of illicit financial flows, methodologies of corruption have changed in the last 50 years. You know, 50 years ago, if I was a, if I was a corrupt actor, if I was a criminal, all I had to do is park my money in a bank account in a foreign country in my name. And that would be it, no one would care. You could be blatant and open about it. Today, where we are is a situation because there is increased regulation. If you're a bad actor, you have to find new ways to hide your money and make sure um, that you, know, you can retain your ill-gotten wealth. And so you see this evolution of, you know, and I think what is perhaps most telling is the World Bank did a 30-year study of corruption. And they found that the one, the singular most common method that was used across 30 years was the use of companies. And I think what I really liked um, what someone said yesterday is, which was that, you know, the victims of, of corruption are in the country, but sort of the perpetrators are very much a global network. And I think that's what this tells you is that we aren't in this fight. It's not just a domestic, it's not a national fight. The very nature of money laundering and illicit finance and corruption is that this is, this is a cross-border movement of money. So you are only as strong as your weakest link. And you know, the, what the 30 year study did talk about is, is essentially is that you see money from Africa, Latin America, Asia, leaving the countries, but they, were, they all find their homes in um, the US, Canada, Europe. Uh, and, and, and that's what sort of really emphasizes the role and the value of beneficial ownership. Having said that, as we talk about the evolution of um, how illicit finance moves, you see investments money now moving into investments in real estate, art, jewelry, buying precious metals, buying yachts, buying horses. And now we have to, I mean, if anyone's been following the news, you see these, the ridiculous um, people selling their tweets and assigning a value to it. 
you know, yeah. it's, it's only a matter of time because that becomes another money laundering scam. And so essentially it's the movement of money into alternate assets, which one, what becomes problematic is that it's much harder to identify a forensic or an audit trail. And second, you know, it is also, you can sell these properties you can sell these assets and that's what you know that's what what that's what beneficial ownership helps you do it's not just about companies it's not just about the extractive sector it is essentially a tool that is able to target this whole host of illegal activity into a whole host of new assets so if i'm buying a boat if i'm buying a horse if i'm buying expensive million dollars worth of art if i'm buying ex- a vineyard in france which you know very often you see a lot of west african um, um uh, um, sort of African countries, a lot of their money laundering is in is in France or in, in an Angola's case, a lot of the money laundering is in a place like Portugal. So you, all of that, you know, is deeply and intrinsically tied to the expansion of the use of beneficial ownership. And I think that's what, you know, we are here to be able to see today. But I'm going to stop with that so I can I can move to the next question, I think, if, if Janine has the next question. Yeah, no, thanks, Lakshmi. I think, so my next question kind of, I think, builds on, on what you've just said. So, so what practical examples of beneficial ownership, transparency, data use exist for practitioners in government, civil society, think tanks, and other relevant actors? Um, yeah, keep it from the reports. Um, you know, absolutely. And one, I want to say, I know my colleague just posted a bunch of resources, one, mm. two documents, which uh, one is on Kenya, one is on Uganda, and they cover a whole host of examples of where beneficial ownership um, should have been used, where you have found the beneficial owner where there isn't a law in place. But essentially, I think what it, what it attempts to show you is that beneficial ownership is such a cross-cutting issue in that it has an impact in almost every facet of your if your daily life. Mm-hmm. If you think about, oh, are you are, are you concerned about the environment? Then because everything has a, every anything that has a financial element also has a beneficial ownership element, and that's the best yeah. way I can talk about it. Mm-hmm. So we, you know, just to sort of give you, I I, I know there's a lot of the, we've talked about yesterday the fact that you know the AU did a report where they show you know in the African continent the primary exports tend to be minerals and precious metals. And with gold, 77% of it, tax yeah. revenue gets lost to the continent because you don't, you know, companies are able to evade it. But I want to talk about sort of the less commonplace examples because I know we have our colleagues here from Senegal and Ghana and uh, both countries, you know, their coastlines have been devastated by illegal and irregular fishing. The, a, a huge thing that um, beneficial ownership can do is this ability to track and identify who owns these fishing vessels. So there is, a, there is a legitimate case to be made. You know, Kenya's neighbor, Somalia, the reason we see Somali piracy today is because the root cause was, you know, Somali fishermen, uh, their means of livelihood was taken away because of illegal fishing and that turned into piracy. That's another way. Um, I wanted to sort of talk about how in the African continent, um, you see, um, human trafficking being close to a $13 billion industry. And you know, the sexual exploitation of women counts for about $8 billion in and of itself there, just in human trafficking. A lot of the times these women, women are recruited saying, you can go work in the Middle East as you know, a help or, or in some sort of either labor recruitment. All of that is done through front companies. Um, the, and I, the last thing I wanted to sort of touch on is because I know this is relevant to the whole group is we're talking about the, the implementation of the Continental Free Trade Agreement. Yeah. It, is, it will open up incredible benefits to the whole continent. But at the same time, as you know, we've already spoken, I think TJ and Alvin yesterday talked about how only 15 countries have it, which means that countries that don't have it, you can, you can much, much the same way you exploit secrecy jurisdictions that don't have strong beneficial ownership laws or pro, pro, uh, you know, allow you to hide your identity. The absence of beneficial ownership will also mean you can see an increase in trade-based money laundering and other things. And and especially as someone that's worked with the African Export Import Bank, Africa currently has a trade finance gap of over, um, well over 120 million, 20 billion, which is 25% of the actual financing needed to finance trade through the continent. And, you know, with COVID, you see so many scams happening. Having beneficial ownership information, one, 
is allows you to plug this gap because you can judiciously understand who to provide who to provide uh, financing to and know the individuals behind it um, if there are more questions i'm happy to sort of talk about other global implications but i will stop now in the interest of time yeah no thank you so much i think for taking such a complex topic and finding a way to squeeze it within 7 minutes and that's great and i think also you outlined i think for me the importance of this needing to be a cross sectoral issue and i and i think you you rightly mentioned we we often emphasize the extractors industry but really it's applicable to almost every single sector um i'm going to go now to um our next uh panelist uh, and this is daniel gibondo who is the chairman of slaty um the msg bio committee and and i think now what we want to do is 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 sort of nationalize the conversation a bit um and look at how beneficial ownership transparency data can be used by governments to address national priorities so so my question to you um daniel i just want to confirm are you on the call if so could you turn your your video yes, on I'm, I'm, i'm on i'm on perfect great so my question to you is what are what are the relevant what are the relevant relevant government priorities on transparency and accountability in in sierra leone so just a couple of minutes on that go ahead daniel Thank you and um, good afternoon everyone. Um it's really interesting that we are now taking it to the country level and it was an interesting discussion from uh the previous um speaker. Um for Sierra Leone transparency and accountability is a critical is a critical um commitment of government. Um in part because of the huge challenges which we've had um with corruption. in our country and um the current government is very serious about ensuring that we address that menace because it has been at the core of our country's uh, development um, challenges and um what we've done is a to get the laws strengthening to give teeth to to the laws and um that started out with giving prosecutorial powers to the anti corruption commission where the anti corruption commission doesn't need um <clears throat> the fiat of the attorney general to prosecute corruption matters in a um, court as it previously used to be so the commissioner can go to to court and then um, prosecute matters directly um also through the anti corruption commission it's not just about prosecution it's also about awareness raising um transparency and accountability issues have to do with behavioral patterns of people and in a country where corruption has been um in the past institutionalized is going to take a very long time to get people to understand that corruption is actually at the foundation of the problems that they have and that corruption is not just at the top level um where the taxi driver refuses to take you to your destination and rather says I will take you to this destination and you pay me for this and you pay me for that and um the the teacher asks kids to bring money to school instead of um arts and craft as we used to do when we were kids these are the little things that really are the building blocks of um, um corruption so awareness raising about the dangers of corruption to society is um, um critical and the, the the third priority for for government is uh, institutional strength you you can you can have all the laws but if the institutions are not strong to um close the gaps to lay the foundations to address corruption is going to be really very um difficult for us um our president uh, in dakar in the uh, bio bio conference in dakar expressed very strong commitment to the implementation of beneficial um, ownership and in doing so um mandated all institutions that are critical to accountability and transparency to up their game for example the financial intelligence um unit um the corporate affairs um, um commission that is responsible for registration of um companies and it's actually like the gatekeeper for companies to enter and operate legally in Sierra Leone and they are going to be very critical in the implementation of beneficial ownership framework um i must say from the begin at, at the outset that for us uh, we are not yet where ghana is 
we're looking at beneficial ownership from the within the extractive sector. We've not gone into other sectors um, yet. We want to see how its implementation within the extractive sector, given its critical importance to our economy, is. And then a decision would be made whether how to expand it to um, other um, 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 sectors. Um, the last point I would like to, to, to make is the prevention of corruption itself. Um, how do we support our institutions, public institutions particularly, to look at uh, institutional arrangements and uh, put in place mechanisms that would ensure that we all comply with procurement laws, that we ensure that um, things are done right, and that we ensure that all any gaps that exist for um, channeling of illegal funds are addressed. I must state that um, transparency and accountability is really critical for us, not only in the extractive sector, but at this point, um, as far as the conversation on beneficial ownership um, goes, it's about the extractive sector. Great. Thanks, Thanks so much, Daniel. I think it's so nice to hear as well that there's support um, even you know from from the higher levels of government for to promote beneficial ownership disclosure. So maybe just a quick uh, question: How would the implementation of, of beneficial ownership transparency um, contribute to addressing national priorities? I, I think you, you've spoken to the fact that it's right right now being sort of focused within the extractive industries, but you know across the board, how would it help contribute to addressing national priorities? Well, the first thing is um, government would like um, to see how uh, beneficial ownership would help us get a good deal. You know, um, one of the challenges in getting a good deal from the extractive sector is uh, the agreements that we have with mining companies. Mm -hmm. So we have very powerful politically exposed persons at the back, you know, um, driving the process. You know, we would have tons of waivers that would amount to government getting nothing. And um, you, you, you look at some of the mining um, um, deals, then you ask, what is it really that we are getting? Um, and again, it also um, frustrates legal reforms because if you want to have effective reforms that would generate um, revenues for, for government, there would be scoppers who might be behind the scene. So we see beneficial ownership um, disclosure as a framework that would clear the space of um, uh, people with hidden agenda that would, frustrate government's efforts to get the right um, deal. So once we are able to know who the real operators are, then we can, um, um, we can um, be able to increase the revenue um, and threshold for government. And that is critical for financing the yeah. social economic um, uh, infrastructural development agenda of um, government industrialization of the sector ensuring that our people benefit as well as create an environment where investors will benefit as well. Um, it's, it's another um, 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 good um, benefit for us is to ensure that we deal with the question of um, transparency, right? Ensuring that who these players are. And um, it's also etched in our history given the, the, the civil war, the role of the extractive sector in financing the civil war, who are the actors? Ensuring the government does not do business with people they don't want to do business with, that government only does business with people that would support its um, development um, 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 agenda. Um, our, our history is such that the, the extractive sector was really notorious in um, financing our civil war and we want, in addressing that um, um, infamous um, past, we want to know who are active in our sector and that whoever is active in our sector, whoever is investing in, in our sector, sector is a credible business um, person. And um, in this process, data um, credibility is also critical. I know my time is very short. <laughs> it is short, but I think, you know, just listening to you speak, I, I, I hear your passion about the subject, right? I think if we're able to, to know, like you had mentioned, for example, you know, who is who is involved in some of these deals in the extractive sector, um, it could really help in addressing some of the national priorities that are, I think are, are, are requisite. Um, I'm going to move over now to uh, to a good friend of mine, uh, Mr. Demba Sedi. He's the Publish What You Pay Regional Coordinator for Francophone West Africa. Uh, and, and he'll be giving the civil society perspective. And I think speaking to some of the, one of the issues you just mentioned now, Daniel, around disclosing the deals. 
Um, so, so Demba, I think my first question to you is how are, how are civil societies using um, information about beneficial owners and political exposed persons of companies to support advocacy efforts? Um, Demba, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Go ahead. Great. So I'll speak in French rapidly to... No, no. Yeah. Go ahead. Great. So, alors, je, je, je veux dire que quand Public Secoupé s'engageait dans le mouvement de la transparence il y a maintenant 20 ans, on focalisait beaucoup plus nos efforts sur la publication des informations financières. Euh, parce qu'en ce temps-là, celle-ci constituait le plus grand enjeu pour beaucoup de pays riches en ressources minérales. On voulait savoir où va l'argent. Aujourd'hui, la problématique de la transparence a pris des dimensions plus larges, et plus inclusives. Euh, D'où aujourd'hui la pertinence de la publication des bénéficiaires effectifs. Et cette publication, pour nous, repose sur trois postulats. D'abord, de plus en plus, les législations dans les pays euh, riches en ressources attribuent de façon formelle la propriété des ressources au peuple. Cela donne de facto aux citoyens le droit de regard sur toute la chaîne de valeur, y compris sur les bénéficiaires effectifs des droits des retombées des produits extractifs. Le deuxième postulat, c'est que la transparence inclut davantage une participation effective et qualitative de tous les citoyens, et notamment les femmes. C'est ce qui explique aujourd'hui tous les efforts de publier ce que vous payez visant à imprimer une dimension féministe à la gouvernance des ressources naturelles en Afrique et dans le monde. Et enfin, le troisième postulat, c'est que notre agenda citoyen de renforcement de la gouvernance des ressources minérales accorde une attention essentielle à la publication des contrats, ce qui va expliquer notre campagne Disclose the Deal qui demande une publication des contrats. Nous demandons juste trois choses. D'abord, le gouvernement de divulguer la totalité et l'entièreté des contrats d'extraction. Ensuite, que les pays qui sont engagés dans l'ITE puissent respecter leurs engagements conformément à la norme qui a été révisée en 2019. Et enfin, la troisième demande, c'est que les entreprises manifestent publiquement leur engagement à soutenir la divulgation des contrats. Donc, vous verrez aisément, pour répondre à votre question, que l'information sur les bénéficiaires effectifs et les personnes politiquement exposées constituent une étape clé pour atteindre la transparence. D'abord, elle permet de prévenir les risques de corruption et de conflits d'intérêts parce qu'ils arrivent souvent au processus d'attribution des licences. Ensuite, l'information sur les bénéficiaires effectifs peut prévenir les inégalités, les irrégularités et les anomalies en termes de transfert des titres ou des droits de propriété. Il y a eu une histoire récemment en 2018-2019 qui s'est passée dans beaucoup de pays. Euh, ensuite, si nous reconnaissons tous les bénéficiaires effectifs, nous saurons les tenir redevables et responsables de la gestion des revenus ainsi que les impacts négatifs des, des opérations d'extraction. La réponse pour la première question. Great, thanks. I, I have a, another question for you. So how, how, does, how does this conversation about beneficial ownership transparency in, align um, with other civil society efforts? So around gender inclusion and ensuring community impact as well. Oui, je, je l'ai dit tout à l'heure au début, la campagne de public se couper a beaucoup évolué ces 20 dernières années. Passant de la demande au gouvernement et à l'industrie de publier des données purement financières à maintenant savoir à qui il paye, qui paye quoi et dans quelles conditions on l'en paye. Cela implique la divulgation des contrats. Mais ensuite, qui est impacté par les opérations? Aussi bien les femmes sont impactées différemment que les hommes. Et qui parle l'espace civique aujourd'hui? Et pourquoi, par exemple, dans plusieurs pays, les membres de la société civile font face à une restriction massive de l'espace civique parce que tout simplement, ils réclament des droits qui leur sont naturels. Donc, je crois que c'est en ce sens qu'un accès à tous ces différents types d'informations que les acteurs du contrôle, aussi bien les parlementaires que nous, les citoyens, ou les corps de contrôle qui ont été créés par les États pourront effectivement demander au tenant des droits de rendre compte sur l'utilisation des ressources naturelles. 
Et ce qui est important aussi dans le contexte de la transition énergétique, où l'on s'attend à passer des énergies fossiles à des énergies renouvelables, il est nécessaire de garantir la transparence de cette transition à travers, bien sûr, les bénéficiaires effectifs, mais aussi à travers la transparence des contrats. Et enfin, dans le contexte de la COVID, où les gouvernements se battent sous une pression financière importante et que les entreprises cherchent à renégocier les contrats dans plusieurs pays, je considère que la publication des contrats et de la propriété réelle contribuant à éclairer le débat public pour garantir aux citoyens que les ressources leur bénéficient également. Thanks, Demba. And then my, my last question to you, if you could do it in, in 30 seconds or so, what role would you say civil societies have to support government and private companies in collecting BO data? Alors, notre rôle traditionnel, c'est d'abord d'influencer les pratiques, les politiques et les lois ou normes, si vous voulez. Donc, en ce sens, nous pouvons faire davantage de pression sur les gouvernements pour galvaniser la volonté politique, parce que c'est souvent ce qui manque dans le processus. Alors, s'il y a cette volonté politique-là, nous considérons qu'effectivement, y compris la publication des bénéficiaires effectifs, que les personnes politiquement exposées sera une réalité. Donc aujourd'hui, il faut comprendre que cet agenda-là est assez politique, parce qu'il implique beaucoup de fonctionnaires de haut niveau de l'État dans les pays qui sont riches en ressources naturelles. Et aussi, c'est un agenda qui touche à des intérêts privés qui ne sont pas souvent connus par le grand public dans le secteur extractif. Donc, euh, c est, c est, c est, à la limite, ça, notre rôle, c'est de pouvoir booster ce, ce, cette volonté politique. Ensuite, en mobilisant aussi d'autres acteurs tels que les médias qui sont très importants et incontournables, et les masses populaires et pour changer les normes concernant les accords qui existe souvent entre les compagnies et les États, mais aussi qu'ils soient responsables et redevables dans la gestion des ressources naturelles pour amener les citoyens à bénéficier davantage de ces ressources. Merci beaucoup. Thanks, Demba. Thanks so much for those comments. Um, so now we're going to move to, to the private sector and, and, and to answer some of my next questions. We have Lola Adekanye, uh, who's from the Center for International Private Enterprise. So Lola, my first question to you is very simple. Why does the private sector need beneficial ownership data? Lula, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, again, thank you. Thank you, Chennai, and, and uh, it's good to be here. Interesting conversation. Um, I think the first things first, it's, it's, it's great that private sector is now being brought into this conversation because for the longest time, beneficial ownership, beneficial ownership transparency, um, reforms and, and implementation, and discussions have been driven by, you know, um, civil society organizations and the global network of them uh, and government. Um, but to be effective in implementation, you definitely need the private sector to meet you halfway and sort of self-regulate as well. So um, that's an interesting question. I think it's particularly interesting because the tendency when it comes to anti-corruption intervention is to focus on law enforcement and sanctions. Now, that can work, but you will not get um, critical mass of the private sector to implement um, uh, the anti-corruption, to back the anti-corruption reforms and to implement their own side of um, compliance with um, anti-corruption laws and beneficial ownership transparency requirements. And so I think the first thing to think about would be think about um, how businesses and companies rationalize uh, compliance, how they rationalize corruption. Um, they think of it in the context of costs and benefits. And when you think about the benefits, that's where you want to emphasize why private sectors, private sector and the business community should be um, interested in, in beneficial ownership transparency and the outcomes of that. First one would be, of course, fair competition. In reality, um, quite a few economies, Nigeria, for example, is one, um, there's a lot of politically backed monopoly in quite a few sectors. In the power sector, for instance, where you know there's been privatization going on over the last 20 years, um, 
in 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 the in the power in the power sector in the um energy space as well um what you what you find is companies are unable to fulfill their growth potentials and these are companies that are not politically backed um because they are not able to compete right and so private sector in in countries where the private sector has grown to a certain level of sophistication um they're able to compete and bid for economic opportunities with um foreign organizations they are basically locked out of the opportunity to to grow um and to participate in economic in the economic um, um growth of their countries and so that's the first thing you know but that that companies should well that should be highlighted to companies why um why is it important to do that um because when companies rationalize corruption or anti-corruption efforts they think about it in the context of costs and benefits again right and the costs of compliance in most african countries are still too high um, for most companies um, the cost in terms of compliance the cost in terms of getting licenses in terms of you know filing your taxes to a large extent these things these processes are not efficient in most countries or if they if you know if you're talking about access to licenses in highly regulated industries let's say in the extractive um, companies find that they easily get these licenses if they're able to buy access right if they're able to have politically exposed persons or politi politically connected people um in their network right or in their in their in their in their company and so um while the cost of you know compliance is so high you also have the issue of retaliation or extortion happening where companies um say oh we're clean we don't give bribes and then they're excluded from opportunities these things still happen um in many countries where we work today um where we where, where our projects um run about 12 countries on the continent and the flip side of that is um corruption seems to be beneficial at least in the in the short term the compounding effect of that is it undermines the culture of compliance in the private sector so you talk about beneficial ownership transparency compliance uh, um you know the the uh registrar from ghana was talking about only five percent of companies really have provided their information uh, the idea is there is already a very low culture of compliance and so if there is a low culture of compliance amongst businesses you're not likely to find businesses complying with um, the beneficial ownership transparency requirements and so it's back to the point where um i don't think sanctions alone will do it i think thinking about the broader compounding effects of the lack of transparency, lack of beneficial ownership transparency, and the, the weak culture of compliance um, is the way to think about getting private sector's commitment to ethical business growth. And that touches on a, a, you know, a couple of things I'm happy to touch, talk a little bit more about. You know, some of them I've touched on just you know, as I spoke, the cost of compliance being too too high, um, and a few more I'd like to talk about um, um, later. But I'll I'll stop here. Yeah, um, yeah I'm actually going to pick up on that point. I know we have three questions, but because of time, I'm actually going to you know sort of double click on that. So so what does private sector need then um, to enhance private sector's use of bio data? So are there any practical examples of what potentially hampers um, or can incentivize companies to comply with bio disclosure? Um, do you have any examples? I think that would be useful to this conversation. So yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a, that's an excellent question. So let's take um, let's take the example of the Shell Any case. If anyone's followed it, I'm sure you might have seen the OPL um, two forty five, the acquisition of the OPL two forty five oil block in Nigeria, for instance. One of the major things um, that stood out to me there was Shell was not aware of the fact that the oil um, uh, block that they were buying was owned by a company where the former minister of petroleum had interests in. And, and that just is the basic way of talking about access to credible, verifiable, easy, quick access, and efficient, really, access to credible, verifiable data, right? Whether that's true or not, there is a controversy. Um, some people say they knew, some people say they didn't know, but the point is um, access to that data would have been 
if the data were easily access accessible, we wouldn't have that conversation. Now, the other point is, and, and here's where CS civil society comes in to sh you know, join hands with the private sector. Um, when we think about um, African countries and the capacity to implement beneficial ownership transparency, I like to think of it on a spectrum, or if you like, in a metric. There are countries where um, beneficial ownership transparency implementation um, is weak, actively weak or passively weak. Now in, in Nigeria, I'll say, you know, it's passively weak, not actively weak, because what you don't have is a press that is ca as capable as the current the civil society organizations to research and put out this information publicly every time. You find out that when there is um, the case of Shell, for instance, you find out many years later. And, and this is the sort of thing that you know in the in the US, for instance, or in um, in in Europe, um, the press is able to access this information and put it out quickly enough so that while the due diligence is going on, while the negotiations are going on, um, if there isn't enough transparency, you know up front, right? So the OPL 245 case is the first one where almost 10 years ago um, this agreement was negotiated, but we're only finding out now. Um, that there were there was a conflict of interest in in that process, and and there are several other cases like that. You know, you'll find this in the um, in the energy sector in Nigeria, uh, or even in the telecom sector in Nigeria, where the regularization happened almost 15 years ago. But we're just hearing now about the ownership in, the ownership interest in companies that acquired huge telecommunication assets from the country. So you the 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 beneficial ownership laws are there. CAC's you know, website is open right in front of me. I can search for companies. It's, it's all, it's the, the, the legal framework, legal and legislative framework is there. Um, but the capacity to utilize that data, to use that data to, gen to demonstrate transparency, to demonstrate that conflict of interest issues are you know, clarified is not yet there. It's, it's, so that's why I call it you know, passive weaknesses in, in the ability to um, implement and utilize beneficial ownership transparency infrastructure um, to really keep the private sector on its toes and keep the private sector committed to the efforts to, uh, to beneficial ownership transparency. Thanks, Lola. I actually have one, one more question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to you. So, so what role would you say that private sector can play in institutionalizing um, some of these beneficial ownership regimes? Do you think there's an actual role for, for private sector? Absolutely. I think the major role the private sector can play and should play, and I think it's only, it's only the private sector that can play this role really, um, is in self-regulation. Mm -hmm. um, in the compliance processes, and, and the private sector is broad, so you're talking about the financial institutions. Um, financial institutions, institutions have to do KYC and due diligence each time. Um, they have uh, all kinds of, so in, in Nigeria, you have the challenge of um, banks give, doing, getting involved in insider dealing, where they're giving loans to entities that are also owned by owners of those banks. So shareholders of, a shareholder of company A, um, you know, has, the highest percentage of loans um, from a bank where they are also shareholders, right? You have those kinds of issues where uh, banks need to use and need need to use this data and enforce the beneficial ownership um, transparency expectations. These are expectations, and you expect the companies to do their due diligence to make sure there's no conflict of interest when they own assets, when they give loans, when, um, when they onboard people um, to their boards, you expect them to use it. So self-regulation can, you know, there are several dimensions to that, but that's one, you know, use that data and apply the, um, apply the, the expected um, level of due diligence and risk management decision-making. Um, in addition to using it for themselves, they can self-regulate so they can require that other companies in the business environment do the same, right? They can do this through, you know, screening their supply chain and their value chain. Um, of course, financial institutions, as I said, can do this um, for, for commercial loans, but other companies that are not um, commercial institutions have huge supply chains and networks, and they need to do that for their supply chain and network um, uh, so that they, th that's the way that they self-regulate. The other thing is they need to educate themselves. Um, 
companies may not know and understand uh, the, the need to, be, to know who the beneficial owners are of companies that they, uh, they trade with. But it's critically important now because we're finding that you know, companies could be trading with high risk entities that they will have no clue about or entities that have you know, uh, their, their shareholders or ownership, other ownership SPVs in some tax haven, and it's fine. There are no red flags and they don't um, uh, require that uh, additional transparency or enhanced due diligence should be done. But companies need to educate themselves about those risks, you know, and, and do that. So I think self-regulation is critical. Um, enforcing compliance standards is key because that's why the data is there. The data can be there if they don't use it, then it's all great work that just is looks good on paper, but it's not being used. Thanks, thanks, Lola. Thanks, thanks for that insight, and I think thanks for highlighting the role that specifically financial institutions can play. Um, so I'm just going to let I think everybody who's on the call that you can go ahead and put some uh, any questions that you have or any comments that you have in the chat box. We have I think about ten minutes um, to go through those, so please go ahead and do that. Um, Lakshmi, there was, this is more a comment, I think, um, that we got from Sven saying that um, beneficial ownership is already part of the fisheries transparency initiative. Um, the FITI standard is similar to the EITI standard for oil, gas mining, and mining, addressing transparency aspects in, in marine fisheries management. Um, and so they're working with their colleagues in Seychelles and Mauritania. I don't know if you had any comments, I think, just, just to maybe, uh, I don't know, any thoughts that you have in response to that comment? From no, I mean, I, I know, I think, you know, that is that is fantastic. It's, you know, um, I, I will say that, you know, for example, like Liberia is a major country for a flag of convenience. So you're also going to see something uh, like, a, you know, the big challenge with implementing beneficial ownership registries is if it starts to cut into government revenues, and that's what you see, like, for example, like in the, in the US and globally, like in the UK, the US, Canada, they are big company registrations. They, they provide companies to the rest of the world. So the big challenge in implementing expanding beneficial ownership is when it starts cutting into the country's revenue, when it is counterproductive. And so, you know, you're going to see sort of the, the balance and the struggle with that for certain sectors. You know, we talk about fisheries. I, you know, when it's in Ghana, Senegal, I'm sure it doesn't matter when it comes to Liberia, they will care about the extension and expansion of something like that because they're a big provider, a flag of convenience. So, so, you know, those are just things to, those are sort of the consequences to think about or the challenges to think about as we seek to sort of expand the impact and value of beneficial ownership. So I'll, I'll leave it at that then. Awesome, thanks Lakshmi. Um, I think as, as we're sort of wrapping up, I would like to hear, I think if there's any comments from any country um, beneficial ownership transparency implementers, um, please feel free to unmute your mic and then I'm happy to then uh, pick on you. We'd be keen to hear, I think, how you've been relating with some of the other stakeholders within your countries in terms of promoting beneficial ownership transparency. Um, whilst we're doing that, there's a comment here from uh, Tim Law indicating that he agrees that the private sector are an important stakeholder group as users as well as suppliers of bio data. The largest user group of the UK public registry is SMEs doing due diligence, doing due diligence. and I think just to sort of reiterate what Lola just said there. Um, as, we're, as I'm waiting, what I would like to do maybe is to pick on you, Demba. Um, I think you've shared uh, some work that you've been doing as public, what you pay. I think I'd be keen to hear how has your interaction been, I think, with some of the BOT implementers um, in some of the countries that you work in as, as published what you pay? How have you been received? Can you share some of your experiences as, as civil society? Demba, are you there? Yes, yes, I am. Sorry, I, I was on mute. Yes, um, <laughs> yes, we have... We have been interacting with people implementing this, including from EITI, and so that it gets more inclusive. You know, more and more in several countries, they have undertaken additional legislation to take into account the, the, the beneficial ownership uh, issues as it was not part of the traditional legislation they used to implement in these countries. So we've been part of the reforms in a couple of countries so that it can take into consideration the, the civil society demand for more transparency and how to put a link between 
the BOT and the other efforts we've been undertaking on the transparency movement as well. In addition, how it can involve uh, local procurement as well, because this is a great part of the, let's say, on the revenue mobilization and sharing as well. I mean, the local procurement. Because when you compare the figures in terms of financial flows in the, in the, in the local procurement and the traditional tax and other kind of mobilization of revenues the governments are having, we see that the local content is including much money, it's involving much too big money. So it's, it's a kind of a window of sometimes for corruption and conflicts of interest. If the BOT does not include or does not involve that piece of work as well, it will leave down a great piece of uh, risk of transfer uh, of corruption. So that's why and how we as civil society have been interacting with EITI and other stakeholders, including from the government side, to see how we can take into consideration all these aspects, including the reforms that are being undertaken in these countries. Great, thank you. Okay, so I can see some more comments coming in. Something from Yako saying, we also shouldn't um, overlook the potential role of labor in, pub in private and public sector self-regulation. BO data can be used by unions in order to, de to detect and challenge, um, for example, illicit profit shifting within companies. I think that's great, absolutely. I think that the, the conversation around, you know, beneficial ownership disclosure really, um, I think needs to and can incorporate so many different um, stakeholders, including the labor union. Um, fantastic to think to see Lakshmi also indicate um, it's 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 also incredible to customs departments. Are you saying that it's it's also incredible? I, I, your comment there, Lakshmi. Well, I was going to value it's incredible value <laughs> to customs departments, revenue or revenue departments, revenue services. It, Whoever is responsible for the movement of goods in and out. Great. Okay. So I can see, I think if I'm reading your name correct, where Drago, would you like to say something? I see you've turned your video on. Um, Cause I think we'd be really keen as well to hear to some of the, I think, um, you know, actual implementers, how their interactions with different stakeholders has been. So if there's anybody who would like to say anything, please go ahead and, and unmute your, your mic and then happy to, to pick on you. Um, what I would like to do, I think, as we wait for that, um, I'm keen to, to head back to um, our colleague from, from Sierra Leone. I'd, I'd be keen to hear how, um, how your interaction with particularly private sector has been, I think, in your efforts, um, Mr. Daniel Gibondo, um, you know, to, to, of course, enhance beneficial ownership transparency, because often um, I know here we have um, private sector that are allies uh, in, in support of what we're trying to do here. Um, but I'm keen to hear, you know, the different types of interactions you've had with private sector in, in, in essentially trying to do what you've been trying to do in Sierra Leone and how that's been received. Uh, so are you there, uh, Mr. Daniel Kibondo? Yes, I'm here. Awesome, great. Yeah. No, um, um, you know, the, the, the private sector, particularly the, the Chamber of Mines, you know, we were working within the extractive sector they are, they, are, they are key allies in our, in our efforts. Um, they are part of um, the Sierra Leone EITI um, MSG, which is really driving this um, process. Um, in even coming up with uh, legal reform, they've been very supportive and part of it and then um, getting the comprehensive definition that we have. And um, it was really interesting when we're um, discussing the threshold, whether it should be really, it should be low, it should be high. They played a key role and it was interesting that some of them were really interested in having it low. So we have it at 5% or more um, for beneficial ownership um, um, disclosure. Um, <clears throat> it's not only on the beneficial ownership thing, the, the private sector has been really very supportive in our legal and their regulatory reforms that, that we are doing. And um, this conversation is actually happening at a time when we, we are reviewing our main mining law and um, we have um, provisions exclusively for beneficial ownership um, there. And um, they've been very supportive of that. And um, so we see 
greater compliance from, from, from the private sector, particularly investors in the extractive sector. Once we, we roll it out, um, we expect the law to be passed late by end of this, well, not this month, so late next month, we will have the law passed. So um, the private sector definitely have been, have been um, um, allies in this, in, this, in this process. Great, that's, that's really great to hear. Um, so I think what we've, we've now come to the end of this particular session, I think listening to all of the different insights from the different stakeholders has been really um, incredible. But I think also to note, as, as we were seeing in the chat, there's so many other stakeholders that can actually contribute positively um, to the work that we're trying to, trying to do here as we increase beneficial ownership. I think as I indicated, I work for an institution that really sees beneficial ownership as key in promoting um, resource mobilization on the continent, um, but also curbing illicit financial flows, something that I think Lakshmi spoke to um, quite, quite well when she opened up, I think highlighting that it's something that um, is indeed important and I think needs to be looked at across all of the different sectors. So allow me to thank my panel. Thank you, Lakshmi. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Lola. Thank you, Demba, for all of um, the, the contributions that you gave to this particular session, all very interesting. And I can see now we're getting some comments, I think particularly on private sector um, participation within this conversation. Um, so, so thank you for making time to, to be present. And I think thank, thank you to everybody who stayed to listen into this conversation. Maureen, I'm going to hand over back to you now. I know we've, we've come to the end of this and you can indicate what the next steps are. Thanks, Maureen. We've now come uh, to the end of our program. We have just some closing remarks to give. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for, for all the energy. Uh, I think I mentioned at the top of the event that we would have a survey that we would share with everybody, um, just for you to uh, give us some feedback around whether your expectations have been met uh, by, the, by the workshop and what you'd, uh, what you'd like to see next time. So my colleague Marie will share um, that in the chat. Um, I think for me, before I pass to Louise and, and Ian, um, the things that I have heard are one, high level political support, how important that is. I think we've heard from the Nigeria example, the Ghana example, um, specifically why it's important when it comes to passing legislation. And then ultimately when it comes to, uh, to enforcing compliance, you really need uh, that cover and that backing. Uh, the other thing I think we heard uh, pretty clearly is the need for institutional strengthening. Um, again, I think that came out very clearly in the Ghana example, uh, where they were handheld is what uh, Jemima said. Um, and I think it's important. I think if that's um, understood basically, um, um, you know, by the institution that's implementing, uh, then you have definitely a better chance of, of progressing uh, the reform. Um, the other two, I think one is coalition building. That one I think we can't understate has been spoken about pretty much by everybody. There's a lot of expertise. There's a lot of capital in government, in civil society, in private sector, with our development partners. So it's important for us to build these coalitions around beneficial ownership uh, transparency. It's not an easy reform. Um, you will find there are a number of vested interests sometimes that will push back. So it's important for us to leverage all the capital that we can bring uh, to advance it. Um, and I think OGP, <clears throat> uh, multi-stakeholder forums, EITI, uh, multi-stakeholder groups, those are very important opportunities, platforms to really convene around, around the reform. And there are a number of action plans being co-created this year uh, for, for, for OGP countries. So please take the opportunity uh, to action some of these things we're talking about in your action plans. And then the only thing that I wanted to, to say beyond that um, speaks to the, the issue of open uh, public registries. I think, you know, for, all, for all, all of us, that is what we're really looking for, right? So if, if, if we have closed registries, then it really takes away from what it is that we're looking for, which is the transparency. Uh, so for us, I think to keep that at the top of our, our minds, as we're advocating for this reform, as we're implementing it, uh, that we really need to make them open and public. So I'll stop there, Louise. Thanks, Maureen. And I'll keep this brief because I know we're reaching sort of the, the limit of everyone's Zoom attention time. Um, it's been a real pleasure to 
hear from everyone today and to have such a rich dialogue uh, about the issues that really matter for implementing beneficial ownership transparency and it really is fantastic to have this community of people all focused on progressing this work and on that note, um, I wanted to share news with you all of Open Ownership and the EITI's new joint programme uh, to unlock the benefits of beneficial ownership transparency that our speakers have just been highlighting. The programme is called Opening Extractives, and it's a five year programme of work funded initially by the BHP Foundation. And it focuses on three things. Um, firstly, on enabling more countries to disclose high quality data. Second, on supporting stakeholders both within and outside of government to use this data to improve natural resource governance. And then third, to communicate the impact of beneficial ownership transparency in the extractive sector. And we really hope to be working with many of you through this and through open ownership, and I'm sure the EITI's other work uh, on beneficial ownership reform. Um, I wanted to highlight just two ways um, to get involved as the programme starts to um, ramp up activity over the coming months. First, please look out for our programme of peer learning activities that will be starting over the next few months. Um, and second, for governments in EITI countries that elect to participate in the Opening Extractives programme, uh, the programme will be able to provide technical assistance with reform. And to find out more about that, um, I will share an email address um, for anyone who would like to contact the joint EITI and OO um, Opening Extractives team, or you can just simply follow up with your Open Ownership or EITI country lead. Um, so I just wanted to say yes before I pass to Ian um, thank you ever so much to everyone for joining us today to the discussion and we look forward to continuing to collaborate with you. Mm -hmm.